Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast. My name is Xavier, and today we have the honor to speak to the great Robert Bruce, author of Astral Dynamics, who has had a presence on the internet for a long time. Mr. Bruce, thank you so much for doing this podcast. Welcome. Yeah, nice to be here, mate. So, um... There is a litany of things that I really want to go over with you, but um, let's start. Let's start with something simple. Let's start with you know how. What's your story? How did you, how did you get into this? Like how did you figure out that you were going to be an astral projector? Well, I started astral projecting about the age of three or four years of age, and. Uh, my first experience was I just just buzzed all over and floated out of my body. So wow, that's that's early. You started when you were yeah. three years old. So I was, was it three, maybe maybe four? Okay. Um, but no older than that. Now I'd had a now keep keep in mind here. I have an excellent recall of my childhood. My memories go back to into my mother's womb and be just before I actually joined with my mother mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, before I was con- just before I was conceived mm-hmm. um, so um, the memories of my childhood are quite uh, strong now before I astral projected the first time where I floated out of my body mm-hmm. um, the I had an experience a few weeks earlier, probably about about two weeks earlier, where um, this was an experience I've had many, many times, and I had many times also (coughs) up until (coughs) about my mid-20s to Mm -hmm. late-20s. Now, where I would find myself paralyzed with a type of vibration uh, that is similar to astral projection like vibrations which are reasonably comfortable once you get used to them but this was a, a vibration that is like um imagine a vibration which would give you the feeling like imagine if you chopped into a big piece of aluminum foil right you know that the static that kind cold of... shiver you get up and down your spine if you imagine it it's sort of mm-hmm. chomping into that and, and or, or cardboard mm-hmm. um so very unpleasant feeling and uh, I was always paralyzed. I was only a little lad. Mm-hmm. So it was uh, very fear inducing. And <clears throat> just before I had my first astral projection, uh, I had one of these experiences there. And it was always the same. I paralyzed this icky vibration going through me, sort of high pitched vibration. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a light coming from above my right shoulder always. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, this time, I managed to turn around without physically moving. I now know I was moving <coughs> within my uh, within my physical body. It was my second body or my etheric body that was moving, if mm-hmm. you call it. And I turned around. It was like moving through mud and looked over my shoulder and looked at the light mm-hmm. and where all this was coming from. And what I saw there was a large ET oh, wow. uh, of the tall gray variety oh, which wow. had a body had a body like a um a praying mantis with the big triangular head and the two big eyes and uh if you if you look at uh, you know uh, Whitney Strieber his yes. book Commun- his book communion mm-hmm. on the cover they've got the head of this big triangular head of an ET with big eyes it was that was the head Right. In, uh, so you were three years. Like, so you were three years old when this happened, or how old were you? Yeah, I, was, I was about three and a half years of age when this happened, and I looked at this being and this ball of light, which is about the size of a soccer ball and glowing and sort of vibrating. Right. And uh, I looked at it just for a couple of seconds, and the being uh, looked at me, noticed I was looking at him, and reached out and tweaked the ball of light, and I was out like a light. You know? Wow. When wow. I was but about two weeks later, I had my first astral projection mm-hmm. where I just floated out of my body and I floated feet first like I was still in bed mm-hmm. through my bedroom, down the hallway, down the stairs and uh, through the house. Mm-hmm. And 
then I came back to my body and it was like, you know, I was a bit scared, but not that scared because it, you know, I didn't know to be scared of it. And I had another one. And then I had several astral projections a night, every night, for years, hmm. many years after that. So and let's, that was where it started. Let's, let's rewind just a little bit. So the... The praying mantis that you saw. I mean, what what influence did this this being? Was it was it? I mean, was it affecting you? Is it the reason that you started projecting to begin with? Did you ever discover that? Looking back on it now, <clears throat> logically, it altered me. In it altered you. Yeah, I and think many people in our world have a similar experience where they're altered, hmm. and. I don't know why, but I mean, it gave me OBE abilities. I became uh, pretty clairvoyant and awakened a lot of my psychic abilities. Do you think there was some uh, kind of a transference of some form of ability or clairvoyance from this entity, perhaps? Well, logically, um, I think they were the vibration of that I experienced was something like a high tech form of hemisync. Okay. Okay. Will be sound. Right, right. Because many years later, um, several years ago, when I first time I went to the uh, Monroe Institute in uh, uh, Virginia. Okay, so you do have experience with the Monroe Institute then? Yeah, I visited there. I actually gave a workshop there once. Oh wow! Um, did you was the I I know um, Mr. Monroe. He did he pass? Like, what was the the time frame? Was he gone, or was he still at the institute? Yeah, he went, this he was, was a couple of years after, or so after he died. Okay, but I still met him there. Oh, um, okay. yeah, his uh, spirit was very strong there, and his spirit visited me uh, the night before, <laughs> which was an interesting story. <clears throat> the, um, <laughs> yeah, say so when I <clears throat> when I visited there <clears throat> with some friends and another author, uh, Maureen Cordell. Um, who wrote uh, the book Suddenly Psychic, which is a, a very good book. Mm -hmm. uh, they put on, uh, she's one of their senior outreach trainers there, and she gave me a mini gateway workshop about four hours, mm -hmm. me and a few friends which were there. And I'd never tried hemisync before because, I mean, I never needed it. Right. Uh, but as soon as I, the frequency started playing, the binaural beats in the ears and that, I recognized the type uh, what it was and what it was doing to my brain mm -hmm. uh, as being related to uh, the what I'd experienced when I was a kid. Right, right. So, so the hemisync. So when it, so you were you were three or four, and you 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 start projecting. You, you begin the experience of projecting. You've always felt this sort of light above your shoulder. You look over, and it's this praying mantis being, and you suspect that maybe it could have altered you in some way and you recognized that the, the hemisync itself was somewhat correlated is that, is that did it kind of reactivate it or it just kind of uh, maybe re-triggered these events you think uh, no I, I always remember those events it didn't trigger anything but I recognized the effect it was having on my brain the hemisync the binaural beats the sounds the frequency that they use. Mm -hmm. um, I think it started off with a focus 10, but mm -hmm. I recognized the effect it had on my brain because it gave me this like falling sensation inside, pulled me into an altered state very quickly. Wow. Um, mind you, I can do that you know, manually, but I recognized the effect it was having on me as being related to, not the same as, I'm not saying the ET was using focus 10 hemisync, <laughs> I think it's using very sophisticated in comparison, but there were similarities there in the feeling it, it uh, gave me. And it's only logical that I say, you know, I think they altered me uh, because of the uh, power I started having after projection after that, and many other things sort of pointed to that, uh, some kind of alteration there. Did the, I'm sorry, did the astral projection frequency or intensity uh, become altered after these sessions with these binaural beats uh, or after your time here with at the Monroe Institute like it was before? Was there any kind uh, of distinction? No, there was, it made no, no difference to me afterwards. I don't think. I mean, it possibly, 
because um, I've um, I've used them a fair number of times now, mm-hmm. and I find them quite handy for. Um, oh, it's just nice to play with gadgets and that. And uh, so, do the, you do you still have contact with these extraterrestrial like beings? I mean, do they still? I mean, what is their purpose? Like, what's what's going on there? I don't know. It's intermittent. Now that was my, my first experience. Mm-hmm. My um, next experience with uh, ETs, uh, you could say, or UFOs, I was about 18 years old, and at the time I was in the uh, Mercantile Marine, Merchant Navy, uh, okay. non-military, um, mm-hmm. cargo ship, um, and we were up the um, uh, top of Australia near Darwin, mm-hmm. uh, which is the top left-hand corner there, and... Um, I, saw, I was in company with the uh, the third mate and some other people there as well, and it was about two o'clock in the morning, and we saw this gigantic um, spaceship hmm. come down, hmm. and it looked like an asteroid shape, like a watermelon shape, and you could see it was metal, had pop marks like little crater holes in it. It was the size of an aircraft carrier, <laughs> uh, absolutely huge, mm-hmm. and it was coming down because we were out out there on the uh, women's bridge and uh, we saw it very, very clearly. But it was decelerating and it had this uh, brilliant blue-green aura around it mm-hmm. and came down and it hit the ocean or hit it, it touched the ocean about probably half a mile off up Port Porter and it just slipped into the ocean with hardly a splash. Wow. And then there was a bright light coming from under the ocean, and then it took off very, very fast. You could see it moving underwater, probably hundreds of miles an hour. And uh, and that was about 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, a few, a few hours later, we were tying up in the um, uh, the port of Darwin, and it was just on the break of dawn then. Mm-hmm. And I remember looking out to sea, and I saw another one come down in the distance, much further away. Mm-hmm. Of course, because we travelled a hundred miles since then, mm-hmm. um, but it was the same shape. I could see the same blue aura, blue green aura around it, and it came down at roughly the same angle. Uh, we must have just been in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. And the advice I got from the uh, third mate was, he said, oh, "We see these things all the time out here, but don't tell anybody. They'll just laugh at you." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is true. So. Mm-hmm. I uh, told a couple of people they start smiling and if you check your meds <laughs> lately and, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. typical knee They reaction, thought you were crazy. Yeah. Into us. Right. Do you, right. Um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Graham Hancock and some of his works as far as um, his theories. He In his book, Supernatural, he's talking about some of the endogenous um, DMT release could be responsible for some of these alien encounters that people have. Do you feel like there's any kind of neurotransmitter relation here as far as any kind of endogenous release of chemicals that are, is having an influence on this astral projection realm or perhaps any of these other states of consciousness that are being uh, encountered? What do you mean by endogenous release of chemicals? Uh, as far as hit, uh, certain uh, – I know that Graham Hancock in his book, he mentions that he thinks that there's an, the natural – um, extrusion of the pineal glands, perhaps like dimethyltryptamine or the DMT release. Like okay. neurologically, what's happening? What's happening in your brain when you're when you're projecting? Like, what do you think that perhaps uh, you know there there is some sort of like DMT, the the spirit molecule? Um, is that do you think that there is some sort of release that's happening in your pineal gland that that may stimulate this 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 phenomena? I, I can speculate that that's possible because when you go into altered states, uh, there is there are some you know some major activity occurring um, electrically and biochemically in your brain. So that's probably likely. Right. Right. Well, Dr. G, my co-host, he is he's actually a doctor. He's he is a doctor. So so I mean, we we kind of want to know you know how how does this. Uh, affect you in a, in a physical way like um you know so so you started this journey very very early you know it's it's kind of a surprise you didn't lose your mind you know like you're you're projecting into this other realm of of existence you're you're having these encounters i mean normal people normal quote 
people don't have, you know, this experience. So, so how did you learn to control this? Like, how did you learn to you know, work within that space, perhaps, or almost innately, well, it seems? <clears throat> Given my um, um, work on the subject and, you know, in-depth exploration of the astral projection exit and re-entry into the body and that, I would have to say that most people do not have the memory mm, of this mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because the key to astral projection, which is something that everybody does whenever they sleep, the astral body exits mm. as a matter of course. Mm-hmm. Now, every human being does this. Every animal on the planet also does this. Hmm. Dogs, cats, hamsters, horses, I have observed clairvoyantly leaving their bodies when they fall asleep. Now, right. it, logically, I think every living thing after projects. Right. And um, so it, it's an incredibly natural thing. It's not unique to human beings at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know in Astral Dynamics, you talk about the mind split phenomena, where I think your work, it's very original. Um, I think you talk about, I mean, correct me if I'm mistaken here, um, you talk about how you know there's there's kind of a download like you the body project the astral body projects out and your your physical body like you're downloading the memories of the projection is that is that correct yes yeah it is okay okay so i can explain that as the uh, when you have an astral projection mm-hmm. you do you do not leave your physical body mind Okay. You generate a copy of yourself, hmm. and then you exteriorize this. You project that copy of yourself, what like the RAM in the computer mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. is projected out in an energy form. Mm-hmm. And it is that form that operates outside of your body. And uh, it, 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 it gathers its experience memories independently of the physical body mind. Keeping in mind, the physical body mind can be awake and functioning, albeit paralyzed, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Your dream mind can also be active. You could be having a lucid dream at the same time. So that this is the basis of the mind split is there is one, two, three copies of you uh, existing and experiencing simultaneously. Wow. Now, the big question is, of course, um, if you were, how does the, the brain deal with multiple memory streams right and right. and nat- that naturally it doesn't uh if the physical body mind uh is aware or thinking at the time there it's usually those memories that get um retained mm-hmm. uh second to that are dream memories which are easier to recall so if you have a dream or it's a dream uh they may be recalled um right down the bottom of the list is uh astral projection whereby uh, you will remember that because normally we don't recall those. But often you will get a mixture of physical body memory, maybe remembering being paralyzed in your bed, felt some vibrations or something that scared you mm-hmm. and the fears kept you away. And, for, you know, fear stimulates a powerful memory. That's mm-hmm. important to understand the fear causing yep. empowering the memories. Now, while you are doing that, your um, astral body is out as well, and you could be dreaming. But at the end of it, when you wake up, you might have bits and pieces of all three experiences tacked together in a random order. Hmm. So you remember a bit about being paralyzed. You also remember about walking through your kitchen, and then you also remember having a dream. Right. At the, sort of tagged together, like these aren't linear, but they're tagged together for one linear memory you mm-hmm. have but mm-hmm. doesn't make sense and it usually doesn't so i think i think in astral dynamics you talk about how uh events on the astral do they do they happen first on the astral do things exist energetically first and then filter down into the 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 more dense like physical realms is that is it like a top down phenomena or is it like that a is, ton- yeah that is a traditional theory on that well observations say that appears to be correct Okay. But I'm not totally, uh, I don't have enough personal experience on that yet to say for sure that they flow down. But it does appear to, I have to say. 
Okay. The, I mean, I, I go, go ahead, Doctor G. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, okay. The thing that you mentioned earlier about the memory I found fascinating was um, I was looking and uh, reading about Tom Campbell, who was at the Monroe Institute. Um, I don't know if he was there at the same time as you, but he there was a guy. Uh, he, he was. Wasn't. He was I'm there. Not sure. Oh wow. Uh, <laughs> A small world in the in the astral plane. <laughs> um, well, I've done a I've done a bunch of interviews with him. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't read uh, My Big Toe. I think is when he talks about. Um, I think that's the 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 major work that he had where he talks about um, the different observer effects with the pre uh, precognition and the the big computer and just the framework of how he sees reality, which I found fascinating. But he. There was an interview, I think it was uh, related to one of the Daniel Pinchback books that was out, and he mentioned this guy named Ian Wilson who was talking about the Observer 1 in the Lucid Dream and the Observer 2 that's kind of scaled out outside of time and how he could mani- – not manipulate, but through this dil- this dilation out effect of these, these, previ- these this series of observers – be aware of time in the grander sense and recognize that he dreamed future events as, and then started to encounter them in his waking life. And do you, have you had any experiences in the astral plane where you have seen pre-recognized events and manipulated them in a sense where you could see them in waking life or had this like dream deja vu experience, so to speak, as he describes it? Yeah, many, many times. Um, the issue with trying to change something there is um, when you're observing um, something like that, a future event like clairvoyantly or in the astral, you can have clairvoyant visions in the astral while you're having an astral projection. Uh, but if you're having an astral projection while you have a vision, vision instead of seeing the, the, the future event, you'll be taking part of it. Hmm. Ooh. Ah. So it's be like you're there as you could be just an observer inside of the, uh, the stage of the event you're seeing. And that can often make it very difficult to understand what's happening. But trying to change uh, something in a vision like that while you're having the vision will normally um, uh, pull you out of the state you need to be. Uh, it'll ruin the experience because you're making an effort. And people often try to change something. If something uh, scary is happening, they might be seeing a loved one in a dangerous situation, for example, or they think they're about to see something happen, like a car accident or something like that. So if, if you're in a delicate state and you think of something like that, um, you will find it causes like a, a tension to appear inside of you and, and you tense up and it throws you out of the state. So, yeah, it's... Uh, I haven't tried to change anything in the situation <laughs> that I've seen, um, mainly because I've learned the wisdom of not doing so. so. Could you expand on that a little bit as far as why, what, what do you mean by that? Well, sometimes apparently bad things happen for um, good purposes. I mean, the outcome uh, of a bad experience can be growth and okay. learning. Right, right. And um, all through my life, hundreds of incidents, so I, I could see, see some of the bad things that have happened to me, and I could see the outcome now. And I'm looking back on my life now. My, uh, I've had some pretty bad things happen to me more than most other people um, in multiples. I mean, just for starters, my uh, my firstborn son Jeremy was killed at the age of seven. Oh, yeah. oh my! And I'm so sorry. He to hear died that. in my, he died in my arms. Um, wow. He was um, buried alive in a sandslide at a Christmas party. That's heartbreaking. I, I pulled him out just a little bit too late. And, uh, I mean, that'll do it to you. Mm. Did you, and did you but, is this in the astral plane beforehand, or? No, 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 I didn't. Um, I'd had some dreams. Mm-hmm. about something like that but when it happened i mean at the time and maybe sometime after that you would do anything to change that but in years to come i realized by surviving that and growing from that i developed a great strength and resilience on the inside by surviving that and then 
worse things happen to me further down the track. And if it hadn't have been for the first experience like that, I never would have survived the next one. No way in the world. I mean, full-blown demonic possession, nobody survives that wow. under their own steam. But the strength the first experience gave me allowed me, gave me the strength to survive that. And that was a period of my life for several weeks. I don't know if you've read the book on this, the Practical Psychic Self-Defense Handbook. There's mm-hmm. a short version of the story in there. But that led me in another direction as well as studying astral projection, energy work, healing, and things like that. I also started working in uh, demonology possession. That's and, what I uh, want to ask you some questions so, about. Mr. Bruce, let's, let's, let's save that, actually. Let's come back to that because I'm very interested in, in sure. psychic self-defense. I Okay, so my, you know, my thing right now, my quandary is – you know, we all project, you know, like we're, we're humans project, animals project, like, like we're doing it, bees are doing it, you know, kind of thing. So everyone's doing, what is, what is the purpose of this? Is it, is it some sort of like, I mean, you say that the, the universe is kind of like a, a computer, right? Like, a an algorithm, right? So, I mean, what, what is the point? I mean, like, why am I projecting when I go to sleep? Like, what, what's the point of, of doing this? You know, I mean, is there something, is there learning? Is it, it, what's happening? What's happening on our planet? I mean, like, I mean, we, we've heard these events. Like, I mean, if you look at the planet right now, there's so much change happening constantly. And we're, we're being like barraged. Like people are waking up. There is this global sort of ascension process happening. So how does, you know, your astral work where are we like as a civilization where are we as a species like what's our role right now your questions seem to have evolved in the telling <laughs> <laughs> i i've got you know the the foremost <laughs> astral projector you know on my podcast yeah. i'm pretty happy right now <laughs> i'll make some sense out of that one okay, okay. <laughs> get my pie chart the, out here <laughs> the natural purpose of that i think it comes down to what we are. The natural purpose of astral projection, I think, alludes to our um, spiritual potential. Okay. Now, in a natural sense, now, to make any sense of this, it doesn't help if you say humans do this because we're so special. Mm-hmm. Look at me how special I am. Mm-hmm. I'm special. I mean, dogs do it. Right. Cats do it. Dogs and cats, animals also have an afterlife. That mm-hmm. parallels out of humans. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's great similarities. Now, humans are much more complicated, and trying to study the afterlife experience of one human, which can take several hundred years, mm-hmm. um, according to the Tibetan Buddhists, and they seem to be correct, takes mm-hmm. a long time. Whereas an animal, like a hamster, will have an afterlife experience that may last a day or two. A dog or a cat that's lived with humans to a ripe old age may have an afterlife experience that lasts a year, mm-hmm. maybe two. Mm-hmm. A, a cat, maybe even you know, a year or two as well. So you're talking um, about nonlinear time. Like, no, this what? is quite linear. Okay, so in compressed. The, so in like, the experience, uh, it does appear to be nonlinear for the person that has died, for the animal that's died. Right. But as an observer, going into the spirit world, observing this, over and over again, you can see the progress of the <clears throat> animal or the human being. The I've, ascension, I've so, to, so to speak, of it? Yeah, in a way. I've been doing this for decades. Right. Um, probably 40 odd years I've been studying the afterlife. And right. uh, it's a big subject. It takes a lot of yeah, time. Definitely. To uh, follow somebody through the afterlife, including my parents, <clears throat> various animals and things like that, I find a good. To study, including a few famous people like uh, Princess Diana, Crocodile Hunter, a um, couple of famous musicians. <laughs> is, that, there, is there and, a, a, pro- a specific process that happens when the the physical body dies? I mean, uh, like you you mentioned the Tibetan Buddhists, like they talk about Doctor G. Do you remember what what it was called? Uh, but the there's is there is there some sort of like I mean, the bardo so to speak or the the process of the of right the, death, the book of the death and dying as far right. as joining the, the process ecology is of soul. there 
it's like <clears throat> it's like walking into a gym and you've got all these machines and things there and the steam rooms and swimming pools and all kinds of stuff there. But what you do in the gym depends on what you want to do or what your intention is. Mm -hmm. I mean, when a human being dies, uh, the afterlife you will find uh, is largely composed of what you take with you, mm -hmm. your beliefs, expectations, and things. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so it varies for everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. you find some commonalities, but they're rare. Mm -hmm. uh, common experiences because, you know, there's always exceptions here. I mean, the, the questions find a question type theme. It's like an afterlife theme park. You know, what they expect. Uh, the Buddhists will find something different. The Hindus will find something. You know, all the different religions will find a theme park, you know, relating <laughs> to their beliefs. If you have no beliefs, then it's a bit different. Um, but there's, there are some commonalities, commonalities, very, very few. And the most important one to understand, I think, is the anomalies that occur in the afterlife. Because these anomalies also occur during astral projection, lucid dreaming, and they also occur to people that are extremely tired. If you miss a couple of days sleep, you'll start getting some anomalies. Vision If plus. you astral project, yeah. If you take drugs, you can also get anomalies. You what is it? What is an anomaly? What do, you, what do you mean anomaly? In your like your perception is maybe widened a bit, so you start to see astral beings. No, or? I mean an anomaly. I mean, for example, if you're in a lucid dream or an astral realm, and you try to write something down with a pen, or somebody gives you a contract to sign, which mm -hmm. may be precognitive. Uh, I've had that as well. You try and sign your name or anything. Guarantee your pen will start running out of ink after the first two or three letters. Wow. If you know the pen just runs out and you start banging it and it just gets messy, it won't work. If, you, mm -hmm. if you're using a pencil, the nib will break and you just won't be able to, to finish it. If mm -hmm. you are looking at a piece of text, it looks quite normal. If you start <laughs> reading it, you'll get half a sentence into it and then it becomes, it mixes up. Mm -hmm. I call it astral dyslexia. Mm -hmm. uh, if you astral project into the real time zone, you come out into your living room and you'll find your kitchen is on the other side of the room than what mm -hmm. you remember it. And mm -hmm. the door's in the wrong place. Right. What do you attribute that you, to? I'm sorry. Pardon? What do you what do you attribute that to as far as these anomalies? I'm getting to it. I'm sorry. Uh, things change. Um, like and if you're in the uh, having a mental projection, which is a lucid dream is a projection of the mental body. The dreaming is a, is a facility of the mental body. And if you are in uh, an experience and you don't know you're there and you're sitting down, maybe you're having a beer and a, and a bagel, and you'll take a bite of your bagel, it'll taste quite normal and you'll drink some of your beer. But if you look away for a second, your beer is full again. <laughs> your bagel is complete again, it's whole. The same thing happens in the afterlife, you know? chug your beer down, look away for a second, it's full again. I mean, hmm. this is the afterlife. There's free, free beer and bacon. Head back to the beer. <laughs> so, it's one of my favorite jokes, but it's true. It's true. The gluten-free yeah. community is not going to be too much about that. <laughs> yeah. But back to astral projection, and this all ties together. Okay. Astral projection, you could say, is like it's your spirit essence, you could say, coming out of your body. Um, it is an energy, a part of you, coming out of you. You definitely don't leave your physical body while you still live. Okay. You know, possible exception, temporary exception, being a near-death experience where you physically die for a short time and then come back. Um, but everything does that. Now, if you think about it in that context, mm -hmm. uh, you go beyond the, oh, we do that because we're special, we're human beings, God loves us, we, you know, we've got this magical purpose in life. Mm -hmm. Please don't. <laughs> so you the, are an animal. So the the common conception. You are an animal. We're so, animals. So the common conception is that your consciousness transfers into this energy body and you leave. And and so so what you're saying is that th that doesn't happen. That that you're duplicating. Yeah, it does to an extent. Oh. Okay. Okay. It does so and it so you're you're in your body, but. You're not in your body. So, I mean, earlier you said 
something about duplicating your yourself, right? So I'm I'm a little bit confused. Um, I mean, I've is, I've had it I've is had, an inherently confusing topic because <laughs> you're dealing with multiple, multiple aspects of the one. Right, right. Well, just just moving forward here, we we've spent a bit of time on this, but. I, I really respect new energy ways a lot. Like I, you know, when you when you first put out Astrodynamics, I, I got it right away. Like I was I was very much into Robert Monroe. He's he's one of my heroes, along with you. You're you're one of my heroes as well. But, um, uh, you know, new, I, when I read, I always always kind of had a, a problem with the visualization and the way that people explained it. You know, like uh, it was just it it was like you said inherently confusing. So when I when I started reading Astrodynamics and using new energy ways, it it affected my energy body immediately. I, I felt it immediately. So, I mean, how did you, how did you come up with this? I mean, like, where did you, where did you learn this? Like, how did you? I so discovered like that if you could say it was given to me by my higher self. Um, the, <clears throat> at the time I discovered that, I mean, I going back, well, I was probably, 39, I think I was 39 at the time, 40. So it's about 29 years ago. And I'm like 59 now. Okay. And the I was just living alone and I was used to meditate a lot. And one day I was sitting down meditating by the fire. And I'm just playing around. I mean, you know, tweak that, what happens, pull on this, see what happens, exploring. Right, And right. Uh, I... I had been thinking and theorizing, which, which I do a lot, and thinking about different ways to stimulate the energy body. Because at the time, I was using visualization-based energy work. <laughs> but I didn't realize it. I was connecting kinesthetically with my touch feeling. I was using body awareness <laughs> without realizing it. So if I visualized the blue ball of energy moving through my arm, I'd also feel that. Mm. And that's why it worked. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, 75% of people don't do that. Mm-hmm. They just visualize like they're seeing something, but mm-hmm. they don't connect to the physical body, so the, the energy work doesn't work mm-hmm. um, well for them. And uh, I just had a theory it popped into my head, and I know I was being guided little bits like breadcrumbs being dropped into me of realization <laughs> to give me ideas. And I realized, <laughs> that, well, if you've got major chakras, I thought to myself logically, you must also have lesser chakras <coughs> theoretically and mm-hmm. the likely place to look for them would be in the in the joints so mm-hmm. i started on my uh, big toe mm-hmm. on my left foot i think it was thinking well i know according to reflexology and acupuncture the mm-hmm. feet are very very important so it's likely there'd be something there so i just started playing around and sort of feeling you know in my big toe trying this and trying that and then i started uh, brushing it Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. brushing action on there. And after a few seconds, it lit up and started to buzz and mm-hmm. drop. And I thought, oh, what's this? Right. So I kept doing more of the same and I started working on my other big toe and other parts and then the whole foot. And then both my feet were like, wow, it's almost painful, the energy that was pouring through them. And then I, from that, I went to start exploring my body and this and that and I tried the same methods on my chakras and they activated very, very strongly. And uh, and that's how I did it. You could say accidental, but I know now because I recognize the symptoms that mm-hmm. I was guided. Something was like giving me a little lunch here and there mm-hmm. to uh, mm-hmm. give this, this new type of energy. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then later, a couple, I did that for a couple of hours and then I uh, was going to go to bed and I was sitting in my office bedroom at my computer and with a lamp on and a, you know, fairly low light and I was thinking about this because I knew it was really, really important to the world. Mm. And, I, I, you know, well, I've discovered something. It's like winning the lotto and you keep checking and rechecking your numbers. <laughs> Is it really? You know? Have mm. I really won this? It's kind of like that mm-hmm. because in my mindset, discovering this was equal to winning the lottery. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then there was a flash of light in my bedroom, and a being appeared to me. And it was uh, mm. a large, you may have read the story about this. It was a, a dark skinned man in a bright orange robe with a huge bush of fuzzy hair. 
Hmm. And uh, I didn't know who it was at the time. I was clueless. Uh, mm-hmm. My mother explained who it was the next day because she recognized my description. And it was Sakya Sai Baba, the Indian. Oh, who like, okay. Who died okay. a couple of years ago. And I was thinking about this, and he sort of telepathically spoke to me and said, now you've got it, well, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> I got, so I, I went to instant denial in my mind. I said, no, no, years of work trying to make sense of this and do something with it. Come on, what are you going to do with it? And I said, no, oh, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and wow. he was there for like 30 seconds, and then he vanished. But, I mean... I don't know why this happened or why things like that happen. They just do. Right. And you have to kind of, um, a motto of mine, you could say, relating to life and mysticism is keep smiling, pretend you know what you're doing. Pretend you know what you're doing. Keep smiling. <laughs> don't blow it. Okay. <laughs> That's, yeah. That works because a lot of these things that happen to us are mysterious. Right. And we don't have the explanations. We can't say, oh, that's this and this should come next and that that's very human thinking but we probably understand the world about spiritual matters we probably understand less than one percent mm-hmm, mm-hmm. me i probably understand five percent it's very socratic of us you know <laughs> very yeah, yeah very and it's also exciting because there's a huge amount of stuff to explore out there but there's a there's a trap have you ever heard of an expression, uh, a term, um, the middle plateau? Mm, no, I don't think I have. The middle plateau is supposed to be, um, this is, I don't know where it comes from, Buddhist, I think, Buddhism or Hindu, whatever okay. it is. Okay. And uh, the middle plateau is an area, once you start to get out there and you start getting spiritual interest and spiritual abilities, you hit something they call the middle plateau. It's like a dimensional area it's explained to Okay. <clears throat> the way it's explained, it's almost like you were after projecting out there. Okay. Now, this level is full of mischievous and deceiving spirits hmm. and all kinds of demons and stuff running around trying to misinform us, disinform us, lead us this way, lead us that way. They'll tell you mixtures of truth and lies uh, to mislead you, basically, and you could spend your whole life <clears throat> being misled in this area, think you've really gone got somewhere. But the trick of this, like they explain, is to ignore all of this, mm-hmm. and the saying goes, "Niti, niti, not this, not that," and keep going, keep meditating, keep doing your work until you come out of this area, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then you'll mm-hmm. be, be standing in the light, surrounded by masters and angels and that that do exist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what people don't understand about that is we live in the middle plateau. Mm. This is the world we live in. Intrinsically right now, you're saying. Exactly. There are hundreds of religions and belief systems out there and this and that, and that you literally cannot tell the wood from the trees. You mm. cannot tell what is truth, what is not truth, what is delusion, what is this. I mean, you, you can't tell. It's like telling which is a true religion. Would you say this is analogous yep. to like the, the state of the third chakra where we're in this kind of social element, we're above the animalistic second primary chakras, and we're just above getting to the fourth, higher, just becoming aware of our higher self, but we're stuck in this realm of confusion almost? Yep, that, that's a good analogy to it. And it is a realm of confusion, and it's designed that way. It's designed to fail psych to stop you. Because when most people start to open up their third eye and get some psychic abilities, they're exposed to this realm, and it's usually not very long before something grabs their attention and they're off this way. And a a couple of weeks later, they've got a website, and they're advertising themselves (laughs) and giving readings and making a career out of it. This is the stuff I'm I'm actually dying to pick your brain about, because recently I've kind of jumped into this abyss of reading some Julia Novola um, some of the, the Path of Awakening works and came back recently from a Vipassana meditation retreat and looking up on this and they, they mention on some of the longer retreats that you reach this point where, you know, the whole the whole point of being centered and reaching certain points where you're going to be in contact with perhaps entities or beings that will confront you and try to lead you astray off that path and you have to be, I guess, in your seat of self, so to speak. And 
part of the path of awakening that a lot of these, I guess, 1920s, like Italian fascists were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. He mentions this third part of the awakening that I can't quite grasp because I guess I ha- they say that you can't know it until you've gone through it. And it, I think it's in his Introduction to Magic um, uh, book that he wrote. And in this section, they're talking about, and it, it, make, it resonates with what you're telling me right now, as far as there's a section on the, like the ghost realm, so to speak, where you're in what they say is you're projecting out your kind of nonsense. Like you will start seeing beings and entities as these projections of your internal symbols and getting lost in that and trying to rise above that. Is that tied, is that tied in or do you feel like there is an actual hyperdimensional realm that there are entities vying for our energy or what mm-hmm. what do you make of this space that we're trying to clear through that's so confusing it has like an almost a real estate to it well that makes sense i mean whatever they're competing for they're competing for our attention our energy some of them are competing to form attachments and even uh possessions where they can attach to us and experience life through us there's multiple reasons because there's lots and lots of different uh, entities and beings involved out there but um it's it's designed this way you could say the creator whatever you want to say or it's evolved this way because it's only when you get it and you have to learn this through personal experience um that you you know it's you can start you can find a way to make sense out of it all and this would explain to me, I think I was a bit of a slow learner, about the age of 36, a master materialized to me and explained it to me. And he explained to me what he called the way of the master. And there is only one way. And after I tell you, you realize it's the only possible way. Mm-hmm. The way to proceed is through the steps of your own personal experience. Every holy book and script in the world tells you this in some way, shape, or form through your personal experience. Now, if you look at that, you this is applying scientific method to spirituality. And what he explained to me how to do this, he said, make up a list of all the things that you believe in, you know, after the experience, of course, he met. And he said, and of course, page after page of stuff, appeared and there's no end to it all he said now make another list of all the things that you believe in relating to spirituality and that here uh, that you have actually experienced Mm. preferably once and i had a list very very short list of about nine things on there memory serves nine things like astral projection is real because i've done it thousands of times healing energy is real because i've both given and received powerful healing, miracle cures. And a, a short list, like angels are real because I've met a few. Demons are also real because I've met a few of them. Very short list. Now, I had to throw everything else out, <coughs> which was psychologically very uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but he explained to me how to do that because, I mean, I, I'm throwing everything away apart from this. So no longer spirit guides aren't allowed, don't have enough evidence, personal experience with that, this and that's gone. And just leaving me, I felt very alone, very, very small. Um, but I, I, I got it. The reason he explained to me why you have to do this, if mm-hmm. you base every personal experience, you cannot be misguided, you can't be deceived, you can't be lied to, you try this, you try that, and through personal experience, you will know whether there's anything in that or not. Hmm. You know, you can tell because you are doing it. You no longer have to believe and have faith in things that you've never experienced. It's Scientific like, uh, method. Be an open-minded skeptic and proceed through the steps of your own personal experience. Now, what this does, the master explained to me, is um, we exist up here in our mind and spiritually we have uh, perceptual filters in our mind which are shaped by our beliefs, the things you believe in, mm-hmm. and your personal experience. Now, just imagine the average person in this world has a triangular, to use an analogy, a triangular <laughs> belief system. So you've got a triangle, triangular hole sitting over the top of your head. 
Now just imagine that all truth and creativity is spherical, little orbs of truth, always an orb. Now if you try to force an orb through a triangle, you destroy it hmm. or severely damage it because you cannot receive anything that does not fit your own beliefs. Mm. Now, you could say the divine, everything above us there, exists in absolute truth in the now. So if you have a mind full of um, lies and misconceptions and misbeliefs and that there, you try and bring the truth into that, you are out of tune with it. You're not in sync with the truth because you've got all this other, you've got this whole cosmology there you've created in your mind through your beliefs mm. and nothing that's trying to come down will tune in with that. So by re, uh, just basically by redoing your belief system and basing it on, on truth and scientific method, you turn your perceptual belief filters into circles. So you have a circular one and that way the little orbs of truth can come down in, inside of you. Little ideas like Robert Monroe called rock balls little pieces mm -hmm. of information yeah. drop into your head which appear in your mind as an idea or a realization and once you do this it all starts to work you start connecting with your higher self with the divine and you start getting the ideas but and this will manifest through you uniquely to you if you're a musician you will start getting little snippets and little riffs of music and words. If you're a poet, you'll start getting poems. If you're an engineer, you'll start getting ideas for designs. Whatever you are, you'll start getting advanced ideas coming through to you. Now me, I'm a mystic, so I get things about astral projection and clairvoyance and the afterlife and things that I'm interested in and focused on. So but this, this absolutely works, and this is where I came from. Before the moment when the master appeared to me, that I have an article on that called the Catch Basket Concept, which I'll send you if you remind me Please. afterwards, mm -hmm. and that explains the, the, the process. And uh, before then, I was pretty much like you guys, I, you know, just trying to make sense out of things and you know work it out. But at the time this years. happened, I'd done everything. I was banging my head against the brick wall. I couldn't. A lot of experience I'd had did not fit in with other people's beliefs. It's like impossible. It right. didn't fit in with my beliefs. So right. I was like, really couldn't go any further until this event, which is a classic conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel. It's one way of looking at it, which usually only happens once in your life. And uh, But after I applied that, everything started to work. And I started to understand and move forward again in a very, very positive, concrete way. And my knowledge of metaphysics and spirituality has blossomed and is still blossoming since then, based on the foundation of the belief system and by using a scientific method to purify. It's almost like, uh, it reminds me of Terence McKenna's quote where he says, the only things that really, that are truly real are your direct experience in math. And, you know, that, that seems to align. It's interesting what you just mentioned, how uh, it almost seems like your encounter with this master when you just mentioned, would you relate this to almost like a shamanic initiation that certain cultures have as far as this kind of breakthrough that you mentioned with this guardian angel spirit? Yeah, very much so. Now, if I would had if I had had a particular belief which I was, like, programmed to adhere to, uh, this probably wouldn't have happened or it may have been shaped, just like your experience in the body in the afterlife I shaped. It may have been shaped to fit in with my beliefs. I and mean, if I'd have been a, a Catholic, maybe I'd have seen a Pope or something or something you would expect. An angel maybe appeared and gave me this, whatever, took me this information. But the difficulty there is um, getting through enough to make a difference. Uh, how much? Can, I mean, how much can you accept if you have a belief system you really strongly adhere to? Uh, like, you know, your higher self can only work within these parameters, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it can't give you anything outside the box. Now, me at the time there, my belief systems were wide open. I had an inkling, you know, I was just exploring the greater reality under the, the principle that I don't really know anything. Therefore, I'm just gonna pull this and tweak that and find out what this gizmo does and 
just uh, explore it. And I, I, you could say that led me to the point there where I lucked out with this and it was explained to me. I mean, I may never have gotten it without this. I'd still be bumbling along and it could have taken me a long time to realize that some of the things I was believing in and trying to do are practical, they don't work. So, Mr. Bruce, if I can bounce in here, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing through this this explanation is that, you know, we we have these paradigms that are inherent to kind of our experience here on Earth. Like we 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 are taught that you know religion, you know, like worship, you know, Jesus or whoever whoever you're you know worshiping, and these all become like sort of kind of like traps is that correct that that these paradigms are built and because of these paradigms the the progression after you know in the afterlife and after you you've you've moved on becomes slower because it's it's harder to absorb the truth because of these built these pre-built constructs that we experience on earth is that is that correct absolutely Okay. I mean, you could use various analogies for this. Just imagine if you tried to understand the universe mm -hmm. through chemistry. It's mm -hmm. like chemistry was all you knew, so you tried to explain everything through chemistry. You are limited in the sense that this is your knowledge and the only thing you're interested in is chemistry. Or it could be physics, or it could be electronics, mm -hmm. or it could be fluid mechanics, whatever your field of science is. Mm -hmm. You try to explain it as a botanist. And you all will all get a piece of the truth. Right. Every right. religion in the world has some truth in it. Right. Including Satanism. They yes. all have they all have some truth in them, but they wrap them up in a neat little cosmology and blind themselves to the rest of the world. And right. they all do it. And you'll find that some so kind of like in the religions salt. will admit this. So kind of like take a grain of salt with, you know, everything that you're kind of experiencing and, and doing and 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 move forward. I mean, um you know, one of one of the questions that I, I really wanted to ask you, I think I think you were speaking on coast to coast. Like you were you were very from from my memory, you were very underground for a while and um you had a very kind of small type tight knit group of people who followed your work and then you made your appearance on coast to coast and then your work just took off so what's i think you talked about uh you getting to a point where the universe was you know like this this sort of wall this this barrier between like the expanse of the universe and you projecting there it does this ring a bell or yeah call off Okay, um, I think from what I remember, I'm not I'm not sure if my memory is correct here, but um, you talked about kind of breaking through the wall and reaching this source uh, thing. Um, have I you? Ever done... now. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that was that was an astral projection experience, right? And I believe Robert Monroe had something similar. He did. Where a time in my life for years, I tried to go as far as I could tried to find the end of the universe mm, yeah. and I never I never succeeded mm. I mean you can go so fast during an astral projection this is like real time astral projection mm -hmm. you have galaxies whizzing past you like street lights boom 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 I mean incredibly fast <laughs> street because lights. the speed you're capable of in an astral projection is equal to the distance seen ahead and how clear that is and this is why I think if you're on the ground or in a house, you can only walk. When you're outside, you can walk faster. You can go as fast as a motor vehicle. Uh, if you fly, you can go as fast as an airplane. Get out in space, you can go faster and faster and faster, the bigger the distance ahead. But w and one, one day, I went as fast as I could, trying to get away from the few little galaxies I could still see around me, and then I thought I just got away from everything. And then this massive brick wall appeared in front of me. Okay. Gigantic. I mean, uni universal size. Right. You know, right. Literally. Millions of oh. years across, you could say, made out of gigantic, like, stone blocks. And I, I come up against this, and I'm floating in front of this, and I'm saying, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> 
you know? It's like a video game. <laughs> and so I realized the nature of the environment I'm in, so I used my mind to try and rip my way through it like I would do if I was going for a river walk. So right. I started tearing it apart and I managed to rip some of the blocks out and then it started collapsing in front of me and there a big hole appeared and behind that I saw like baby suns and forces and lightning and big fireballs and all kinds of primordial forces. Hmm. It was like insane and like <laughs> pouring out towards me. Wow. These like gigantic like sun like things like rushing wow. around. It was like and what I was seeing I think was the elemental forces behind the universe, you could say in the causal realm. The right. whole on, so to speak, or the the Yeah, and this was a visual of course which I could understand and see. So it would probably be slightly different for everybody if you went for in that position. Mm -hmm. wow. So what what <laughs> so do you believe in God? I mean, do you subscribe? I mean, is there... Yeah, I mean, that's... Yes and no. Okay, can you I expand? Do, I do not believe in a monotheistic deity. Okay. Now, an old man sitting up there above the clouds. Come on, guys. Right. <laughs> oh, mate, please. Come on, 2014. Uh, <laughs> now, there are deities for sure, but a monotheistic, a single deity, no. Now, I do believe in source. Okay. But you could say if there is a God, it is in every everything, every energy, every piece of matter in the entire universe, down to the atomic level and, and below. Everything is a part of source. Mm -hmm. And this is workable. When you start to experience this, and it's very, you could say, shamanistic, uh, and it is the truth as far as I can see. It's the nearest to the truth that I can understand or get to, and it's workable, mm -hmm. knowing that everything is everywhere. I ask people at my workshops, and then I say, take your finger and point to where God is. And if you <laughs> point up or anywhere else, I want to know why. <laughs> and people point yourself. go, oh, what do I do? What do I do? And I said, now take your finger and point to where God is not. People go, oh, oh, oh. And ah. you point down, I want to know why. <laughs> Don't you love our planet? What's wrong with our planet? <laughs> planet <people? laughs> yeah. I yeah. love that exercise. That's that's awesome. I'm going to use that. Well, that, be that becomes obvious, that, of course, that source is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I say, therefore, ergo, you must agree with me when I say you are God. Right, right. Definitely. This is the big tamale, my friends, <laughs> because you actually are God. Yeah. Can Everybody you... is. But if you realize this, the level of your realization, you could literally, become, you, you could do anything. You could part the oceans, you could split a mountain, you could create an entire new world. If you realize this, you transcend the illusion of life. Do you think that the there is, I'm sorry. Um, this is this is unbelievable because if you, a lot of these um, ancient religions are like the monotheistic ones, and you look at the construct of the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Knowledge, do you think that there is an, an, an agenda in place as far as I guess the monkey brain that we've had, or a certain group that that throughout time has realized this and tried to um, constrain us from realizing this? that we are God and that we need these limits to, to actually control humans or the human spirit, that the, we need to put these limitations with these religious doctrines and to kind of have this perversion of the truth. Right. Well, that is correct in, in one sense that, I mean, religious groups, churches, for example, where you have uh, people in power that tell people what to believe and how to believe and how to worship and this sort of thing have a vested interest in keeping control. I mean, religion is the best thing in the world for controlling the masses. Right. Get everybody believing the same thing and doing that. You can control a big group of people with religion. Right. Um, now, there's also the sense that some of these ancient texts and that you might be talking about, the people then had a limited understanding of, or their understanding was shaped in that way. But to the modern mind of the 21st century, it doesn't make a lot of sense. 
we, we don't understand that. There is a lot of truth uh, hidden inside of holy books in the world today, all of them. But understanding it is um, gets more and more difficult. Uh, people tend to focus on the surface of it and what to believe in and what practices to do, whether or not to eat, you know, baked beans on a Tuesday or not becomes a big issue, you know. What should we tell them, brother, you know? Oh, are they allowed to eat the baked beans on the Tuesday or, yeah. or is it the Thursday, as the ancient texts, you know, tell us? And it gets a little bit crazy in that sense. And, uh, I, uh, I can't work with uh, modern religion. I know people from modern religions because a lot of people will stay in a religion because it's like grandfathered in through their family and all that, and they're going to be thrown out of the brownies if they don't go to church on Sunday and everyone will hate them. The programming like, and conditioning, like, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, like if you were um, um, LDS, you know, Mormon religion, if you don't do the right things in that, family and friends, they all turn their backs on you. You become shunned and ostracized. <laughs> so there's a massive, you know, unless you're prepared to say goodbye to your whole family, your job, your whole country, right. everything, Yeah. Uh, you toe the line. And a lot of religions are like that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. They will take drastic action um, in a peaceful sort of a way, you know, you're just yeah. su suddenly being thrown out of the, the Boy Scouts. Exiled, you know, ostracized. How have you personally dealt with this certain alienation that comes from this awakening that a lot of people seem to experience when they go down this path, take the red pill, so to speak, and, you know, uncover these things or perhaps, have, let's say, have a psychedelic experience or they start meditating and they start certain paths, certain doors start opening in their lives and they have to realize that, that they have to choose a certain path. How did you deal with this alienation in your personal life? What recommendation could you make to someone going down this particular route? Well, I did lose a lot of my friends, most of my friends and people I knew when I published my first book. Just doing that was weird <laughs> enough to drive people away. Wow. Just, I mean, I could have written a fiction novel. I could have written a romance novel, anything. Yeah. Yeah. And they were the same, oh, you published a book properly, published it. It's like, oh, I don't know how to deal with that. So they, they, they leave you alone. So, and that was a good thing. Gave me more time to meditate and things. <laughs> uh, because if you look at the type of people that would have a problem with that, I, I don't really want them as yeah. my friends anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but dealing with other people, I've learned over the years some wisdom, my friends. And... Uh, even though you understand the truth of things, like when you understand the uh, um, applying scientific method to spirituality and personal experience, mm -hmm. <clears throat> this does not mean that you can point out the error in what other people are doing and criticize them for it because it's like, wow, <laughs> don't go there. It's right. just not good. People are allowed to believe what they want to believe in. I gently offer my truth. And this is it. And if you care not to pick it up and read further, that's your choice. And I'm good with that. I'm not going to, you know, yell at you or say you're wrong or something like that. It's that's, that's this is your path. This is your life. So there's a saying in the Bible, I think, about casting pearls before <laughs> swine, yeah. which applies here. A lot of truth in that. It goes back to what you're saying about direct experience. They almost have to, it seems, have this direct experience and go through this this. Path. Yeah. So, Mr. Bruce, direct, uh, direct experience, you'll find most of the uh, sacred texts out there in any religion, they at some point talk about this and they tell you about direct experience because that's what it comes down to. You need to have that. And the only way I can see a short, to shortcut that process is to apply normal scientific method, personal experience, to your beliefs and what you believe in. But to do that, of course, you have to examine them, what you believe in and sort of, you know, make up a new a new list of things that you actually experience and start with that. It may not be much, but it's real. And that reality will open you up to more experience mm. of the real kind. You know, more orbs will be able to get to you. So, so Mr. Bruce, I, I heard a rumor and you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but there is there's a rumor floating around in the early days of your work kind of come, coming out that you were kind of uh, a, a recluse, that you stayed away from people completely and you lived you know, away from civilization, away from the cities, 
in the outback. Is this is this accurate? Is this true? Ten years. Yeah, definitely. I had um, children. It wasn't actually in the outback, but it was in a small town in the suburbs of the quiet little house. And uh, I was Mr. Mom because uh, some of my children were young, wanted to live with me. So I was Mr. Mom and fiercely proud of it. And uh, I raised most of my children. Uh, took them through school and that. And, uh, yeah, and that was... Uh, a period of my life when I did a lot of meditating, a lot of healing in, inside of me, and uh, and then after that period, I you know I started getting out there again. But yeah, there there was a period of my time when I okay. withdrew from society. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I just I wanted to know. I mean, I I get that as well. You know, I I about ten years ago I I discovered uh, Robert Monroe's work and I. I wanted to try it, so you know, I, 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 I read about it, googled it, and um, went and gave it a shot. And I, I was kind of successful the first time that I tried, and I, and I kept doing it, and kept, kept moving forward, and having all these experiences, and 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 going further and further. And I think at one point, I, you know, and 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 I know you, it, you give a lot of warnings about Kundalini, but. Um, I, I believe that I had a Kundalini, you know, either activation or, or something happened with me that, and, and that leads me. That's a good segue into, you know, I, I what well, do you? Just what before is, you go on, okay. just to set the record straight here, I don't give it. I do not give a lot of warnings about Kundalini. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I teach it. But I've actually got a uh, a course out on my uh, astraldynamics.com where it's a video based course where I teach people how to approach it and how to raise Kundalini. Oh wow! Okay, so, so from what I remember, and I may be mistaken here, from before, there was I thought there was a big warning against you know, purposely activating your Kundalini. Have you you've shifted well, some over? Of the, some of the uh, my, work, my writings on this and that, and it could be misconstrued. I mean, I raised Kundalini at the age of thirty-four, I think it was the first time, and I did it hundreds of times after that. It's not a do it once and you're done kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and my first time was rough. I almost died. Um, but because I was totally unprepared for it, because I didn't know what I was doing, which was the whole point of the exercise, because at that time I, I would realize that I was getting so much misdirection, redirection, misinformation and that, that you have to really do it. To understand it so mm -hmm. I had a really bad problem I was dealing with I was dealing with several families that had uh, demonic activity in their families uh, particularly the children and I was trying to get more energy to do more about it because what I was doing was helping but it wasn't fixing the problem and there were really severe problems and so I just thought maybe if I raise Kundalini and I'd read like two or three pages on it out of an old spiritualist book. That was all I had to go on. So I literally sat down and worked out how to do it. it. Took me a week to work out how to do it. And logically, I thought to myself, well, I should probably fast. So I fasted for a few days first, and I sat down and did this and did that, and I just kind of worked it out with energy work. And after about a four or five hour session, I succeeded. <laughs> and raised from the and it was like. Yeah, the first time, like the first massive uh, Kundalini spike up the central channel, it almost killed me, uh, I think. And uh, after that, uh, being a little bit bloody-minded, I uh, continued when I'd recovered a little bit a few minutes later and continued raising energy, and that was when the serpent rose, which is not supposed to happen because there's only supposed to be one big event. But after I did that, I continued, and then the serpent, and it felt just like a large snake, as thick as your forearm, forced its way up through my perineum, between the anus and genitals, and I could feel my gut sloshing about, physically move, and forced its way three and a half coils up from my torso and then up from my head. Whoa. And then it, it flowed down over my head, and it felt like, a, like I've got like a four-pound piece of steak hanging over my forehead down to the nose, 
in the shape of a cobra's head. And that's where the analogy, and it is it is an analogy of the cobra, coiled cobra and hooded cobra, but it's also a description of the physical sensations involved with raising the Kundalini in this way. Mm-hmm. It feels like a snake. Mm-hmm. 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 Maybe it comes from our reptilian ancestry. It's interesting. Which is possible, I think. It's interesting you mentioned that because so many other um, – the Cosmic Serpent, I forgot, uh, I forgot the author's name, but he talks about how there is this ancient wiring. I think even like Watson when he – and I'm sorry, I think it was Crick when he was taking at, uh, LSD and he mentioned seeing the coiling of a snake. Um, I know that in the ayahuasca sessions people have and the shamans, they classically see anacondas, these spiraling snakes uh, as – whatever the Pachumama is that they see and being devoured by snakes. So there is some kind of uh, ancient correlation, it seems, with this snake or serpentine kind of figure. Yeah, I think that comes from the uh, reptilian input. Now, in my opinion, millions of years ago, humanity was created and we were hybridized. And the you could say possibly an advanced alien species that were reptilian or even the reptilians which are believed to live on this earth, and I think they do, have, that we have some of their DNA inside of us. And this has given us human beings which are not supposed to be particularly evolved, just got to look around and watch the news to see how evolved we are. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but we have this fantastically evolved, sophisticated energetic mechanism which can be triggered in certain ways which will evolve a human being to genius level mm-hmm. and you get all these appearances of uh, cobras and snakes and things like that around that which is very like reptilian mm-hmm. and this is one explanation of possibly where it comes from that these beings they're far more advanced than us, the people that uh, you could say uh, created the human race through, you know, genetically modification or whatever they did, but they included some of their DNA in them and this was included with it. And they probably didn't realise that because we have the potential, therefore, to actually, um, by raising that part of us, to bring ourselves up to their level. Hmm. Do you think those it's are like extra-dimensional ability. beings? Or Pardon? Do, you, do you think those beings are extra-dimensional or more extraterrestrial in nature as far as um, their physicality or their, their, their being, so to speak? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. It makes sense that, I mean, they have some physical presence. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do things like that. Right. I mean, maybe they visit. I don't know. I mean, as far as I can understand, uh, there are multiple ET racist factions that work in our world today, at least a dozen, and some of them are friendly, some of them are not. Mm-hmm. I've met yeah. some. Okay. Well, speaking of you know entities and aliens and stuff, let's get into let's let's get into some psychic self defense. I, I think I think it's important for people to know people who are interested in astral projection. They they should know how to defend themselves. They should know how to shield. Um, what what's I mean? I, you've written a book on this, so I mean, we, we we're listening avidly. You've you've read the book. I have. You have? Uh, right, the Practical Psychic Self-Defense Handbook. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the, new, the new edition is uh, by that name. The original one was called Practical Psychic Self-Defense. Oh, okay. And the new version is much, much better. Okay. Um, I've updated it with a lot of new stuff than that. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's much better written. Okay. The, um, yeah, what do you want to know about it? Well, uh, I mean, let's let's go into, you know, shielding. Like, like, what what can a person do to protect themselves? I mean, what are they protecting themselves against, perhaps, or what are what are some? Right. I mean, what well, are, what are shielding? Uh, I mean, common sense, logically, people who are meditating, learning after projection, psychic abilities, and stuff like that would take some time to uh, build some shields around themselves and learn how to protect themselves. But typically. 99.9% of the time, that's not the case. Uh, people won't do anything like that until they see a need for it. 
And of course, um, so usually people need to get some kind of a bloody nose before they realize they need to take up martial arts. Right, right. Just to go, just to, go to school every day. Right. It's, as is the case here. So uh, usually people have some kind of experience. Now, the book is written for people um, that maybe are, are under psychic attack of some kind. Right. And if you are under attack, you are not going to be able to do any work or meditation or anything because your mind is going to be seething. And uh, you won't be able to read a single page in the book. You'll be lucky to finish a paragraph or two before you'll be so distracted by what's happening, the sensations of it, mm. that, uh, you know, it just won't work. So I revised the, uh, the new version of, with this in mind there. And when you open the book up, you see a quick start guide. Mm. And the first thing you do is jump in the shower. Mm -hmm. now, I remember this, yeah. Why jump in the shower? Well, if you jump in the shower when you're under attack, that will stop the attack cold. Mm -hmm. It will even stop an arch demonic type attack. The worst attack you can imagine will stop it. Mm. Now, it may recommence again when you step out of the shower, mm -hmm. but being under the shower will give you time to clear your head and come up with a plan. What am I going to do next? Because mm. when I get out of the shower, this happens again. Mm. And you may not even be able to walk uh, mm. because you're so convulsed, cramps and tinglings and various sensations and that. So you come up with a plan and then you go, you know, leave, leave the house is a good idea. <laughs> <coughs> Never stay in a house where this is happening. You need to get out of there pretty quickly. Clearing the space, so to things, speak. Is yeah, these things don't move as quickly as human beings. They, uh, they're much, much slower. So you can outrun them. Um, get it. Anyway, um, but the whole idea of my counter magic is they're very, very practical. I use running water. I use electrical earthing, which is the same benefit as uh, running water. Uh, some of the same benefits anyway, where you're electrically grounded to the planet, and that's a, a powerful defense. And using lots of other things, including incense and scents, various scents and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of things you can do, very practical things. Mm -hmm. For example, turning on the overhead light in a room will reduce the activity in that room by at least 50%. Okay. Every, ch every child knows this instinctively when mm -hmm. they ask for the lights to be mm -hmm. left on, mm -hmm. you know, because they know they'll sleep better with the lights off. Mm -hmm. Now, this goes against um, science because, you know, melatonin production and that sort of thing. But uh, just put a black T-shirt over your eyes, you can sleep. At least you can sleep. Hmm. But because the, the alternative is to not sleep because you might be up all night. And uh, you'll be weaker and worse the day after. If you don't sleep for a couple of days, I mean, your mind turns to mush. All of your natural defenses fall and you are completely exposed. Hmm. Is there a certain thing type of being that um, these darker entities or whatever these these I guess negative aspects of that energetic field that they is it someone that's going down this path of awakening that starts to open up and they see this this opening that they can get perhaps vie for power or some kind of control of the human form that they seem to be interested in or they're a certain type of person? Is there a certain type of mindset? Is there something in particular that you've noticed with these exorcisms or perhaps certain demonic possessions that seem to be to make someone almost prone or have a proclivity towards these types of entity attacks? Uh, yes and no. I mean, people that experience these sorts of things have generally got some modicum of psychic ability, even if it's unrealized and unknown. Um, and this includes children. Um, if you were doing develop work yourself, you know, activating your chakras and that, that could uh, attract something which is already around you. But 99% of the time, the entities that are involved are already active in your life. Mm -hmm. It's just you get to a certain point where you start opening your third eye and things like that, you are able to perceive them. Mm -hmm. Now, you can be in a, in a room uh, of people, and let's say you've got a hundred people there are uh, psychic, active, uh, or sensitive, and the other half of the The psychically active 
people will experience the psychic attack um, in their person, the non-psychic people won't feel anything mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. will witness any phenomena occurring like knocks on the wall and things maybe floating around the room or mm -hmm. whatever happens, any phenomena. But they won't really feel anything in there. They'll just feel normal to them. Hmm. They won't feel the atmospheres in that which affect these psychic and type of people. But the, these types of entities can still be active in your life even if you are non-psychic. They can still be exerting an influence on you and on the people around you. One of the um, one of the things I, I would, I've been dying to uh, we can, I guess, go towards this aspect of it. But I wanted to ask you about um, experiences with the psych in the psychedelics realm and the psychedelic experience. But since we're on this topic, um, I had a personal experience with um, what you're talking about when I took ayahuasca down in the Amazon and saw some of these. I guess what felt like. Um, almost ancient lineage aspects to these negative entities. Did you ever encounter anything like that in these, I guess, these children or these kind of exorcisms where there's, um, whether it's through the genetic, the the, the, in, the energy that these entities or beings are interested in through the genetic lineage or that there's some kind of familial, um, demonic like, realm or possession, possession that's, that's happening? happening. <clears throat> Yeah, definitely. There is. Um, we're talking about people here more often. Um, most of the problems with people are from hereditary attachments that come down through the family lines. Now, for example, if you uh, if your ancestor 500 years ago was cursed by a, dru a druid priest uh, because your ancestor happened to be a Roman and he was burning this druid priest at the stake, maybe, and the druid priest cursed you. Hmm. which attached a particular type of entity or demon to you. It's attached to you, your genetic line. It will follow down that genetic line. It's also attached to your name. Hmm. And it may, wow. affect, um, it may affect only males in your bloodline. It may affect only females or it may affect both. Uh, and, yeah, so these things do tend to flow down. And... You can get non-psychic people in generations, you know, and then you get a couple of psychic people born in the family and they start getting affected by these things. So, so basically don't have kids then. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a couple of ways out of that. I've known a number of people, and this is some advice I give to people who um, <clears throat> often want a, a quick fix to something like that. Mm -hmm. And the quickest fix to that is to legally change your name. Mm -hmm. Wow. Surname. Mm -hmm. And if you do that and then yeah. create a new name that no one's ever used before, oh. that way it won't, can't possibly have any baggage on it. Oh, okay. Okay. So like there's a, a lot there's of a... people, and the day they change their name, everything stopped. All the problems stopped. So it sounds like there's some kind of. Um, cause during some of these experiences, you you come to grips with the fact that um, the words that we use and the language really we are the, the world that we live in is formed by our words and the, and the things that we say and the evocation of these names and these namesakes seem to do you think it's harnessed within the name or how does that work exactly? Well. <sighs> A lot of entities are like lawyers, particularly the demonic varieties. If you suddenly change your name and suddenly your name was Robert Bruce mm -hmm. and now it's John Smith or Robert Smith, it's like, huh, you don't fit the list anymore. Like a contractual loophole in the astral realm almost. But, yeah. Wow. yeah, these things are like lawyers. And uh, some of them, there's lots of different types of them and they all work in different ways. There are some commonalities, but there's differences in behavior and differences in what they'll do. But if you've got a serious like entity type problem, it's worth it, worth, worth it, worth trying. Now, one little proviso here: if you change your name, it can cause enormous problems in your family. Mm. Enormous, and uh, because people just can't work with that, it's like freaks them out. So it's a really good idea not to tell anybody. <laughs> Don't kill anybody yeah. and try it. 
Now do that for a few months. If the problem goes away, then work out some workarounds. I mean, you can always use your old name as, a, as, as an alias. You know, so your driver's license is still in that name or whatever. But uh, if it doesn't make any difference, give it a few months and then change it back. So because this, obviously it's not working. This this kind of contractual. I know that we were mentioned before. Um, I just find this aspect of that realm so fascinating. How you know in, in the sh- in the shaman realm, as far as in the in the ayahuasca, the ayahuascaros, they have the practitioners who um, are just the, the general ayahuascaros who are there for health purposes or helping with the grain or the climatological aspects of the tribe. But they mention that there are brujos and there are dark shamans. And do you feel that once you get into this space within the astral realm that you've experienced, or have you ever come, come in contact with a practitioner who perhaps is employing astral projection to maybe align themselves with some of these darker entities or these more of occultic realms towards more of a neg- negative aspect and how are they using it or employing it in the physical reality? Yep, definitely there are people like that. I mean, I have to tell you there is no such thing as black magic or white magic. There is only magic. And after projection, you can say all of that together. There is only magic. It depends how you use it defines what it's called. So if you do good for people there, they will call it white magic. If you do harm to people, then mm. obviously you're using it for black purposes. Right. So, yeah. But the uh, the whole black and white thing is, is badly misunderstood. It's, uh, it's the people involved and what their intentions are and what they're doing. I mean, I know people that <coughs> follow the left-hand path. <coughs> Pardon me that follow the left-hand path and are very comfortable working with demons and things like that, but they do a lot of good. These people are healers, they help people, uh, and they have the best of intention. Mm-hmm. But if you get into studying uh, demonology and that, you, you find they're not really exactly what they, what the, uh, you say, the, um, the modern population in the world uh, has a very Judeo-Christian, black and white, one-sided approach to these things. And there's a lot of shade to gray. Sure, some of these entities are really badass, nasty sort of entity. Like the Baphomet, so to speak, or could you go into a little more detail about that as far as um, the nature of them as compared to, I guess, our kind of westernized version of these, of these demons? Well, some, some demons are actually quite helpful. Some are, some are insane uh, and, you know, they're just mad. And, you know, if you have any compassion in you, you come across an entity that's insane. It's, I mean, you may not want to share your space with it, but you can have some compassion. And that compassion is actually a very powerful countermeasure. Hmm. You can feel genuine compassion for something like that. It will, it will be repelled from that. It will give you. Are these it's got to be genuine. It's got to be genuine. Are these, do these seem to be disembodied spirits or disembodied humans that are in this kind of bardo, or, or are they just another realm of That's just it. being? It's complicated. You have lots of different types. You have ex-human type ghosts. Hmm. You have uh, uh, non-human spirit entities, a huge variety of them. I mean, I use the analogy of like the ocean. The ocean is full of life, you know, thousands and thousands of different species. Most of them are pretty harmless. Some are harmful all the time, like sharks and things. <laughs> Some are only dangerous if you tread on them or mess with them. Then they can be dangerous, otherwise they'll leave you alone. I mean, it's kind of like that. There's like this huge range of species out there. I mean, you've got your poltergeist types, you've got your incubus, succubus types, which feed on sexual energy, uh, and you've got all these other other types of spirits out there, um, and they all do different things. There's very few commonalities between them. So is this when, you, when the Buddhists talk about, say, the, the middle road, so to speak, they realize that, the, or the middle path, is that we're all basically playing in a gray realm. There is no black and white, there is the yin and yang, so to speak, but it's best to just kind of stay centered and be aware of these energies that are around you, but not necessarily bind yourself that with them energetically. Yep. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. 
I mean, you start understanding these sorts of things, you start losing your fear of them. I mean, you might start out, say, a teenager might start out on the left-hand path because they're attracted to black magic and all the glamour that goes with that, or, you know, look at my black robes and my wand and this sort of thing, and you might start working with demons and that, but if you start getting anywhere, you will eventually be moved onto the middle path. Now, you could be like me, you start out with one of the angels and things and doing healing and trying to help people, but eventually you get pulled into the middle path mm-hmm. through personal experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The background, of course, is different, but I mean, I know a lot of the very good people are black magicians, you would call them, called black magicians or magicians of the left hand path of that. And, uh, I often work with them in, in a sense that if I get a particularly tenacious uh, negative entity of the demonic variety, there are certain people I will call upon that are very familiar with working with demons and therefore that's the best person to get to remove a demon is someone who knows what the hell they're doing. Mm-hmm. As opposed to just banishing it. I mean, a, a person with the knowledge will get into maybe some negotiating, maybe some appeasement, Mm-hmm. Uh, finding oh. out why it's there, what does it want? You know, mm-hmm. let's talk about this and then work out a way that it can go away. More of the exorcism know, aspect of things? Is this more of the the contractual aspect of an exorcism you would put this as? Or, okay. It can be because on certain types of spirits, the exorcism won't work. Why is that? I mean, you think about it. Well, okay. You bring a possessed person in. Uh, now, this is just one example of how it can't work. You get a possessed person in, say it's a trial, you bring it into the house there. Now, the mother's brought the child along for an exorcism because of all these problems, and there's somebody in there who's got a badass pentagram. They're going to exercise this child or whatever. The entity just waits at the door and goes for a little wander around the neighborhood. Uh. It waits outside until <laughs> they finish playing around, and when the child comes out and goes home, gets back in again. Wow. Mm. This is very much like if you get into a shower, it will stop. Just about any attack I can imagine will stop cold. Uh, <clears throat> the entity is not stupid. It knows that if it is forced into contact with an, a strong electrical earth, it will be demanifested into the planet, which is like a big electrical generator. Mm-hmm. And there was a, there was a layer of energy uh, that covers the surface of the planet, the water, the land, up every tree, every wall, every roof, inside and out. And this layer of energy is created by lightning strikes, of which there are approximately 7,000 lightning strikes a minute around Mm. the world. There's a lot of them. And what we have is a layer of what I call perpetually dissipating electrical energy, just a fraction above the surface of the world. Mm. Now, and if lightning stopped for some Some reason, reason, this this would fade away in about half an hour or so, scientists reckon it's known about this as yet. Well, entities, a lot of entities, I should say, live in that two-dimensional energy realm. That's where they, that's their dimension, that's where they live. Now, there's a corresponding dimension, you could say, energy field to this. In the stratosphere, because uh, if you look at the way the planet's designed, like uh, uh, the energy comes out through the poles and it spreads out through the stratosphere and the various electromagnetic layers and that which the world has. There's a layer up there as well. So if you deman- demanifest an entity by bringing it into contact with running water or whatever, it is thrown back into the planet. It will go up into the one of the poles and will end up back in the stratosphere again, where it has to ride the lightning down to come back. Mm-hmm. Now, most of them don't understand how this works. So, so if they, they can come, come back, they might turn up in Africa or somewhere, a long way from where you are. Only the higher level entities will manage to get back to you. That will take some time. It might take a few weeks to get back to you. Um, but yes, yes they are complicated. Um, but this is all logical. And this is, I say this is logical how this works because it is workable. When you're working these sorts of things and you're using running water, electrical grounding and things like that, uh, you'll find it, it's, it works, it's predictable, it's reliable, and uh, you don't find any exceptions to it. So the thing you just said, 
is fascinating because if you you know if you look at like what's going on right now in the Middle East and the the Israeli Palestinian crisis, does does it seem to you, or do you feel that these uh, certain certain energetic regions or these polarities that are, are, I guess, manifest throughout the Earth, do you feel like there's certain pockets that are coming out of the Earth that perhaps that we are drawn to, and that's why there are certain regions that are that are sought after, perhaps like say the Middle East or hmm. the certain spot where the temple, um, where the Temple of the Mount is, or where the Kaaba is, or certain religious places where there are. See, or maybe haunted houses, perhaps, or certain, even locally around here, there's certain places where they say um, there are heightened, uh, heightened regions of paranormal activity. Is there something to that vibrational electromagnetic? It's a great question. Here? Yeah. Yeah, there are areas that do have uh, um, different types of energy access to the rest of the um, the average part. I mean, a good example of this is the medicine wheels. In um, USA, you go to certain places, you find big stone circles of rocks that have been placed down by the uh, First Nations, you know, American Red Indian tribes there, and they put these uh, uh, circles of stone down, and that is because they've identified power spots and they mark them when they find them. I've discovered a few of these myself that uh, at some of my um, um, wanderings in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, including one I found in um, Idaho, <clears throat> which was a power spot where, um, and I actually meditated there, uh, lying on the ground in the middle of it. <clears throat> it was easy to find because there was a big circle you could make out in the past where wild horses and mules had trodden it down in a circle. Very clear. Wow. <clears throat> and they also were... Uh, mess in it as well and um, I, uh, I lay down in the middle of that and clairvoyantly I could see these big blobs of coloured energy bubbling up out of the earth like you know it's like uh, gas is bubbling up out, out of the ocean and uh, it was a very powerful spot so that, I'll say there are uh, lots of different spots around the world including negative ones where you get haunted houses and things like that I don't know if any of these religious spots you mentioned um, have any power in them. Um, I think it, it could be just humans being human. Hmm. You do something not for long enough in one place, it can become. So, sacred. Mr. Bruce, have you have you noticed that there's an increase of this type of activity lately, or is it decreasing, or what's happening? You know, as a state of affair on on the astral realm and and here on the planet. The, you could say the energy in the world has been, I think, steadily increasing over the last 20 years. Okay. And it's now uh, getting very, very strong um, for maybe various reasons. Maybe we're going to have another war. Okay. I mean, if you look back to World War One and World War II, the, there was the rise of the whole spiritualist movement all over the world, mm-hmm. and there was a huge amount of phenomena incredible mediums and things like that. I mean, going back to uh, World War II, they had um, spiritualist mediums in England and the USA that did full materialization of spirits. Hmm. You take uh, Helen Duncan, Estelle Roberts, mm-hmm. materialization mediums, they would materialize up to 20 or 30 spirits, which means in, in, an, in an audience of several thousand, Royal Albert Hall, places like that, and uh, the spirits would walk among the audience, everybody could see them, and say, hi, Mum, how you doing? So, yeah, I got killed last week. <laughs> and uh, they were fighting a war somewhere. And uh, I know where Helen Duncan was actually arrested for, uh, um, you know, giving away military secrets at her sciences because <clears throat> people were coming back who'd just been killed and saying where they were killed and, they weren't supposed to be, their ship wasn't supposed to be there, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, loose lips sink ships sort of thing. And, uh, <laughs> but it was through her, she was put in jail and they, it was through her death in jail. She died in jail because um, she was terribly injured by the, uh, the way they took her in the middle of a, uh, the uh, materialization science. They uh, got the uh, fraudulent, they got the uh, Witchcraft Act changed, which is what she was arrested on. To, and they changed that to the Fraudulent Mediums Act. 
So you're so you're, have something like today. So you're saying that that during times of you know this this great kind of chaos, these these beings, entities, things will come and and feed on that energy. So you're saying. I think it's 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 a cycle. You have to liken it to something like a solar cycle. Okay. But after so many years, you have this like increase in spiritual energy in the planet, where you start getting a lot more phenomena and things like that, and a lot more spirit activity. You could say the veil between the two worlds gets a lot thinner. Right. So the spirits on the other side can contact human beings more easily. That that's a part of it. Right. I mean, it may be because there is, in the future, looking at the cause or manifest thing, there is, you know, uh, destined to be a huge conflict and millions of people will die here, and that causes a lot of huge amount of energy to um, you know, affect the world in other ways as well. That may, that may be a part of it. So and we could be coming up towards another war today, I mean, another big one. I mean, <laughs> Have sure seems that way. There's always a bunch of wars going on on this planet somewhere. Just humans being human. That's, that's what it is. It's a natural part of the evolution. Who mm-hmm. mentions it, I think of it? Do you feel that, um, well, with the way – it seems that physics always seems to be 40 to 60 years ahead of the material sciences and – you know, chemistry and medicine are all seem to be catching up along the way. When physics originally, a few about a hundred years ago, had the materialist, you know, Newtonian physics, and then chemistry, everything else caught up with it, and now we're kind of stuck in that realm, in this materialist realm. But now physics seems to be almost in this occultic, you know, uh, this occultic place where we're discovering like observational differences on matter, and it, it almost has a spiritual tone to it. Do you feel that? this new information about perhaps the universe being a hologram and some of Tom Campbell's work about, you know, the big computer and this being a giant computer program, does this kind of validate or how does all this new information, um, if it proves to be valid, how does this, what does this say about your experiences and the nature of reality or what we're kind of going towards? Well, I agree with Tom Campbell on that one. It's a very good analogy that the universe is digital and it can be likened to a gigantic computer program. It's um, all of the uh, physical existence can be. But I don't, um, I don't, I mean, that doesn't really mean anything to most people. It's just a good analogy, a way to try and explain things. But I think it's, uh, it's only natural, particularly with physics, when you're looking at causality about how atoms work and how you can do this and that and you look deeper and deeper and deeper into subatomic particles and eventually you run out of particles to look at and there's only one thing to look at that you're looking at the forces of creation Mm. and it is you know uh, a simple step then to realize that you are looking into you could say the face of god Mm -hmm. you want to conceive this to be you're looking at the creative <laughs> yeah the creative uh, aspect of the universe and uh, I mean you don't have to look at it. I mean quantum physics and that today is you know very unpopular in some areas because it's just too weird you know yeah I'm, I'm sorry to jump around on this but there's one thing I just I've been meaning to ask you as far as we kind of touched on it before uh, before but uh, and you don't have to go into detail on this if you're not comfortable but any kind of personal experiences you've had as far as psychedel- in the psychedelics realm and how they tie in as far as the states that are being reached in the psychedelic um, experience and how perhaps they could work, how certain entheogens can be used to work within this space or are they kind of a, a, short, a, a cheat or a shortcut to get to this place of higher being or do they pr- maybe make you too uh, susceptible to uh, attacks from entities perhaps, things like that? I've never used uh, uh, psychedelics in my I've never gotten around to it. I'm not like against it in any way. I think you'd have to be very careful. But I've never ever gotten around to using them. Mm. I mean, uh, I did uh, try some marijuana on that in the past, but it just makes me really sick. It's vomit, so it doesn't agree with me. So I that was many years ago. So, so I, I've never really had any experience with that. So. 
Well, fair enough. We have I mean, friends that do, friends that take acid and things like that, and ayahuasca. Uh, what do you what do you that, notice yeah. that happens to their energy body when they're consuming these substances? I mean, do you do you see their do you, like do you see their less denser bodies kind of separate? Is that what they're perceiving? Is there more of a connection between that that less dense astral self and that you're you're able to pick up these other experiences? Are you opening a a portal? Are you? I mean, how does it, how does that work? I haven't observed people doing this, so I know people that do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I have done, I've observed the effects on the personality psychologically. Mm-hmm. And uh, in, I mean, psychedelic drugs can really mess some people up, but the Definitely. people I've known have always had pos- positive effects from it, mm. and including the um, the growth inside. If you understand what spiritual growth is, right. spiritual growth is not psychic abilities. Right. I mean, psychic abilities have nothing to do with spiritual growth. Right. Because, I mean, a black magician or a Satanist can have extreme psychic abilities. That doesn't mean they're doing good work. Right. Um, so, so, spiritual growth cannot be separated from growth as a human being and growth and maturity. It's maturing mm. as a human being. Mm-hmm. You ever known a wise old people in your life? Oh, People definitely. In the eighties yeah. or nineties, that are really calm and wise. <laughs> yeah. The wisdom, of course, it doesn't happen for everybody, but uh, you know, generally with age comes wisdom and patience, and that is spiritual growth. Yeah. Now, of course, if you want higher spiritual development, then you will be developing things like patience and understanding and compassion mm-hmm. you know, at a far younger age. Mm. And you understand, you won't just understand it, you'll feel it mm. inside. Mm-hmm. You will feel that patience and that compassion for other beings around you. Mm-hmm. And that's a very good indicator of spiritual growth, just that natural compassion, patience, tolerance, understanding, all of the good things. Are you, um, I'm sorry, are you, are you familiar at all with um, Dabrowski's work with... Um, as far as a TPD or the transpersonal, um, the rate, like, I think Ken Wilber also had a variant of this um, where he talked about these certain <coughs> neuro. A little. Um, Only a little. I know a uh, bit of Ken Wilber's work. Oh, um, okay. You do know Ken Wilber. A little, yeah. Um, I've read a couple of his books, and my, uh, my son follows his. My son's a psychologist and follows his work and, uh, and mine as well. What's your take on that? As far as integrating with um, the astral dynamic concepts, or these the raising of consciousness, and how it can tie in with Kundalini, and these certain, I guess, neuro, um, these neurotic breakdowns that people have, like the experiences that you said you you mentioned earlier that we all have these conflicts, and are these opportunities to perhaps raise our consciousness to the next level? Um, does that fit into the framework, or is there a way that we can use astral dynamics perhaps to become more aware or heighten that consciousness level it does yeah I, I understand only a bit of bit of their work but what I see I like it's a really good way of un- under- explaining it and understanding it which will suit some people uh, some people like that and they will grow from that other people grow from personal experience but regardless of the theory behind it and working it all out you have to get down to the practical one day and uh, like get out of your body, have an after projection, have a lucid dream, and then you will find things like that tend to change you. It broadens your understanding greatly. Mm-hmm. You think about these things, med- meditate these things, particularly meditating on personal experience and what it means to you. Because if you do that, you generally get more of the same and other experiences will come to you which will open you up here and there. And some of the breakdowns that people get are it's like a house cleansing. You have, you know, you could say blockages inside, psychological cysts, trauma memories, and all that, and all the stuff the average person carries within them. And is it surprising, particularly the modern Western people, that it's difficult to spiritually evolve? It's difficult to get in touch with your higher self, which is slash God slash source. 
uh, your higher self is the closest divine aspect that we have access to and it's inside every single one of us the silent observer within us <sighs> which is so close to us we can't see it because it shares the same mind with us it shares every atom in our body as a part of this Hmm. That the seat of self you, you were you referred to um, as far as being connected to the higher the higher source. Yeah, that that is your closest uh, and most approachable and workable aspect of the divine, which is inside of everybody. Hmm. It's I mean, this in vast intelligence, which is the higher self. It's not just like a slightly smarter version of you, um, with a way with words. You know, this is active on your cellular level. It is responsible for your body's own healing intelligence. I mean, how does the cell know to divide? How does the cell know to go and repair this mm. and build this? This massive amount of activity at work inside of you just to keep you alive. The logo, so I mean, to speak, that they, that they speak of. Yeah, that intelligence, you could say, is the bottom end, the basis of your higher self's intelligence. One step up from that, you get to the, uh, you could say, the subconscious mind and the unconscious mind and all the things that the mind does actively in our personality. And then you come up again, there's a little slice here we call the consciousness, which is what we're using right now to communicate. And, of course, above this, you have a, a very big layer, which is super consciousness. Mm. And that is, you could say, point at it and say, well, that's my higher self. Your higher self is more than that. It's integrated through every cell in your body and every neuron in your brain. It is so close to you, you can't see it. And most people spend 20 years or more searching the world and reading, you know, little barrel loads of books, trying to find some way to approach the divine. And when they've run out and exhausted every other thing, there's nothing left with what they knew all along. And it's like, it's embarrassing. Oh, that. You mean, yeah. <laughs> means that I am God. And if you internalize this in meditation, and you begin what I call the internal dialogue. And so that Mr. is you start Mr. talking to source in your mind. And it's like, G'day, you're there, aren't you? And eventually you'll get, uh-huh. <laughs> and you How start you? to get... So Mr. Start, Bruce, if I could just jump in back. here really fast. Um, I, this is curious to me. I, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on this. I, you know, I, you talk about, you know, uh, it seems like our planet is full of suffering. Most people are enduring some level of shit or, you know, another. And we've discussed, you know, like we, we've had you for two hours and we've discussed, you know, the various experiences you've had and, you know, the growth that comes with spiritual learning. So, you know, my question to you is a do you see us having a sense of free will like do you do you think that all of this like is there a plan you talk about you know a compute this being a computer you know like a, we're in a hologram and a computer and so do you believe in fate do you believe in destiny and i mean it, yeah that's the question i, I I know that we're here to grow, but my my goal personally is to get off the planet. Like I I don't want to reincarnate. I would I would rather ascend and and move forward. So how can we do that? And you know, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Well, if you look at the world the way it is, individually, on the community level, the national level global level. <sighs> Suffering is the default level for spiritual growth. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, and it is, because it's only when you suffer a lot that you eventually are turned inwards mm -hmm. and you reach out to God. Mm -hmm. However you conceive God to be, we are all looking towards the same good light. Mm -hmm regardless of your you know, religion or, or upbringing or whatever, we're all looking in the same place, whether you call him God, Brahma, Allah, whatever, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. One thing I've learned about working with my higher self, it 
is all of those things. It d- definitely does not care what you call it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I could call it Bugs Bunny if I wanted to, mm-hmm. and it's fine with that. It's kind of the beyond the need for an ego identifying type name. The best, one of the best descriptions I've come across is, "I am the great I am." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it is, if you if you said that for you, what what am I? I am the great I am. It's like saying I am your higher self. I am your put it in any way you want to want to put it. Anything that you can accept, you know, we're, we're still working with that way. But back to the world again, and, and people as well, on the micro and macrocosm here, the people will suffer until they mm-hmm. learn enough from the suffering to make changes. Mm-hmm. And as for destiny, mm-hmm. I think <clears throat> there is a model <clears throat> destiny for the world, mm-hmm. but we do have some semblance of free will where we don't, you know, we have more of an opportunity for growth. Mm-hmm. This is the growth opportunity presented to us by this destiny. We don't have to do it. If we are weak and we fall, then maybe we'll destroy the, the world and have to do it all over again one day. Mm-hmm. That's okay. That's mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. eternity is a very long time. God forbid, <laughs> right? No, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> could you, I'm, I'm sorry, could you briefly um, go back to what you were saying as far as that internal dialogue you were having with your higher self, <clears throat> as far as the kind of the conversation you were having, you mentioned earlier? Well, prayer, making commands to your higher self, like if you're out in the astral and it's dark and you can't see, and you say, give me light, and suddenly it brightens up around you. You make a command and say, take me to Robert Bruce, and you find a force grip you and takes you there. Now, you can explain this as, oh, my spirit guides are really busy. I've just got to say, give me light, and they turn the lights on, and they take me here and that. There are spirits out there, and some spirits do act like spirit guides. But the real spirit guide that everybody has is your higher self, and is often mistaken as being a separate spirit entity. But it's, it's not. It's much bigger than that, much more powerful than that. It sounds like almost uh, life is art, you know, dancing the razor's edge. Is uh, do you? I know that I personally, uh, some other people I talk to that kind of go down this path, and Xavier and I mentioned this, where there's this razor's edge, and there's you know the physical reality, and then there's these other elements and layers. And how does one? How do you go about dancing this razor's edge and not veering too off towards one side or the other? Well, they say <clears throat> madness and insanity are, is like on the razor's edge here. And when you start to, you could say, develop and push yourself right out there spiritually, intellectually, and that, you do find yourself balancing precariously on the razor's edge. Serving the way, so to speak. Yeah. I wrote a poem about that once. It goes something like, mankind is a rope stretched between two extremes. <laughs> You know, behind you is, you know, humanity. Above you is superhumanity. <laughs> and beneath you, the abyss waits. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to want to jump into the abyss and find out a feather bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we don't know. I mean, we, we confuse ourselves and scare ourselves with our imaginings. Like, I work in, you know, I do a lot of consulting for people with, you know, psychic self-defense and things like that. And scary astral projections and things like that and it's like the fear element there is a growth tool i mean for example if your higher self wants you to remember an astral projection which is a difficult thing to do it adds a little bit to your astral projection and maybe you'll find this man all all black with red eyes breathing heavily going "Mm, i'm gonna get you and of course it's gonna scare the jesus out of you and you've got to remember that you may be getting out of body and you feel hands pulling your legs, things like that, or scary things happening. But this will guarantee that you remember that astral projection or that lucid dream. Without yeah. these events, you will most likely not remember it. So wow. sometimes, it's always best, uh, sometimes it's best to use the fear as like your north star, you would say, and confront that issue in your life. Definitely. It, it, it's a, if you. If you look upon the scary things that could possibly happen to you as challenge, this is happening now and I need to do something about it or not make that decision. And then, you you know, approach it intelligently and show a little bit of courage 
I mean, astral projection is also full of initiations and that. And some of these involve courage and intelligence and honesty and things like that. And you're tested for these things. Mm. You have an experience mm. where you get a really scary situation. But you have to prove that you can still function and walk up to this scary black, you know, monster type man with the burning red eyes there and tell it, I don't believe in you, go away. And then turn your back on it, walk away. That takes courage. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean you won't feel fear, mm-hmm. but it does prove that you can fun- you can control that. It almost has a biblical undertones to it as far as, you know, the, yeah. saying God or the <clears throat> spirit will never give you more than you can handle. Certain, I mean, the Gita talks about that. I know the Bible speaks of that. So it's amazing how this is all connected. Well, yeah, I would say yes and no. There, generally, you could say when when a test is given to you, whether it's in real life or in the spirit world or the astral, or whatever, um, there you are given a huge growth opportunity there. Whether or not you choose to take this or succeed or not is up to you. You have some free will there. Now, survival is not always a given. Mm. There, were possibil- there are possibilities there where you may not survive. Spiritually, or you're saying from in a physical... Physically and spiritually. Wow. I mean, the time when I was possessed, I mean, I had a very slim chance of surviving that. I mean, full-blown demonic possession, nobody survives that on their own without help. Can I mean, please, I've never yeah, heard no, of anybody yeah, surviving please. that. Can we talk about that a little bit more as far as the sure. – sure, what exactly – was there a prelude with the prelude to that or can you – how did you get into this this situation? I became, I became possessed and most people, of course, misunderstand this because of the whole uh, like attracts like thing, which is just – yeah, doesn't work in the spiritual reality thing. <laughs> Opposites also often attract. But <clears throat> I became possessed uh, while I was giving healing to a five-year-old boy. Mm. that was suffering, because I was actively working as a healer, that was suffering um, spiritual possession. Mm. He had a demonic influence in him. And the boy was yeah, about five years of age. And uh, in exasperation at one point, now I'm using healing to remove this. I'm not doing anything drastic like exorcism that. Mm. I'm using healing and prayer and mm. manifestation techniques to free this boy. It always worked for me in the past. And I've done this many times. So this wasn't your first rodeo with an exorcism or anything of this? No. Disney. Okay. It had worked. And, I've, and I'd, I'd had a few scary things in that, like people were materializing in front of me, I mean, or transforming into like a werewolf type being and attacking me and things like that. So it wasn't my first rodeo. But this was, um, anyway, cut a long story short, after a couple of hours of this in exasperation, at one point, I'm, it just popped into my head, this idea. I spoke the words. I said, take me and leave the child. Wow. And it, wow. it did inst- instantly. <laughs> it was like getting hit. It was like getting hit by a boxer. My bottom lip swelled up and... <laughs> <laughs> How apropos. <laughs> yeah. My bottom lip swelled up and bled a bit and I had this big lump. I was paralyzed and like, you know, tortured for like 10 minutes and then I collapsed right. on the ground and it entered um, there or was there a certain uh, spot yeah, I was injured physically but you got so Mr. Bruce, in the lower left right there wow where how long just ago? like I've been punched by a boxer and there was a big swelling there and a bit of blood and uh, but the next over the next couple of days that swelling uh, changed into a gristly lump uh. about the size of a peanut in my lip now this is technically called stigmata diabolus, mm. which is also called the devil's mark or witch's mark. Mm. And if you look mm. at the uh, transcripts of the witch hunts there, if you're caught with anything like that on your body, which is described <laughs> as a lump that neither bleeds nor causes pain when pierced with a needle, like a grisly lump, uh, you are then classed as demonically possessed or a witch, they used to call you in the witch hunts, and you are you're nicked. There's no escape from that if they find the blemish. But if you are accused of witchcraft and they give you a thorough examination and don't find it, you will be released and your accusers arrested wow. for false accusation if they don't find the lump. That's what they're looking for. The people in the, who uh, started the witch hunts knew what they were doing. Um, I've come across this a lot. To cut a long story short, um, 
after a few weeks, this was getting stronger and stronger inside of me. I was mm-hmm. starting to lose control of like a leg. And, I mean, the first instance I had was like three days afterwards when I was sitting there talking to a friend and my hand reached out, grabbed a can of Coke and threw it against the wall. Complex action. Mm. And I'm going like, whoa, that mm-hmm. wasn't me. Right, and right. things like that started happening. And anyway, it got to the point where I could uh, – was getting to the point where I couldn't control it anymore, so I moved away so I could be alone. Mm -hmm. And I was living in this old house for a little while, and uh, I figured I had three choices. I could kill myself, and I win by default. I like to win. And um, because that's why I've never hurt anybody, because it was trying to turn me into an expert. Now, two, I could go and see a doctor and get whacked up a lot of thorazine for the rest of my life, and that wasn't very appealing either. Death was probably preferable to that. Uh, the third thing was the scariest of all, and that was to actually do what I believed in. Hmm. And I had to connect with my higher self right now. No more time. You've wasted too many years already. You're going to do it right now, and you've got 10 minutes. How are you going to do that? So I tried to walk the walk and connect, and I'm, anything that comes into my mind, I'm looking for communication of some kind. And, uh, a long story short, the first crazy idea that came into my head, I did. I did that. I walked down into a storm and got soaking wet and ended up <coughs> bruised and battered. And This is a very short version, by the way. And I came back to my house. I found this rotting piece of newspaper with a few words on it. And I nursed that, took it back home, and I made out a few words on it that said, literally, come to Jared Al Garden Nursery, nestled in the hill, pot of plants, 395. And so from that, I said, right, I'm going to Gerald O. Hills. Mm-hmm. And packed a swag and some rough gear and went out there the next day. And I wandered in the wilderness for like a week or so, uh, looking for blue stones and following crazy ideas and that. And uh, nothing I did worked. But mm-hmm. I was led to a spot which saved my life because I ran out of water. And it was like 110 in the shade. And uh, I was led to a place where I camped, uh, and I was sleeping directly on top of an underground stream of water. And I was guided there uh, to do this. And three days of doing that, and I woke up one morning, walked down to get some water, and this thing just left me. And as it left me, this thing in my mouth exploded into a hundred different pieces, and there's blood and stuff coming out of it. You, you see the direct relationship between the possession and the lump. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, and yeah, that was when I, I I started to learn what was happening. And it was a few years later that I put two and two together with some other experiences, and I realised what it was. Uh-huh. It's the running water. They can't they can't cross running water. Uh-huh. And so uh-huh. when I realised that, I started experimenting with it, and I discovered that it was absolutely true. I mean, ten times out of ten. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, what's your thought process during this whole time as far as um, while this entity is, is dwelling inside of you, is it trying to alter your thinking patterns? Are you combating it on just a, on a physical level or is there a mental component to it? The mental component you have to describe as absolute pollution, the worst thoughts you could ever get. The suicidal I mean, you are mentioning earlier. Cannibalism is tame. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in comparison to this um, what sort of thoughts would a demon put into your mind to destroy you wow. think about it it's like yeah I mean pretty rough uh, I used I had a lot of experience with my mind and I use that to control my mind I and mean, I'm no pushover in that respect and uh, so I knew enough how to push those things out of my mind but it's like continually arm wrestling backwards and forwards right yeah. For this huge so, Mr. muscular Bruce, dude. Is this still occurring or did you happen no. did you exercise yourself and I broke it because yeah. when I in the third morning uh, of sleeping on top of the underground spring and I'm just laying on, on the ground with a little campfire next to me in a hollowed out little tree I was using in the fireplace and uh, I'm about eighty yards from a, a spring of water that's bubbling up out of the ground downhill of me so I put two or two together it had rained a few days ago 
a week ago, uh-huh. um, just before I went there, uh-huh. and uh, the water was running down out of the hills to their spot, uh-huh. where there was a little small pond and it's only six inches deep, but, and there was a spot there where you could see the water actively bubbling up out of the ground. Uh-huh. Now, I was guided there because I was open to guidance. Uh-huh. I mean, if yeah. I got an idea in my head that I'm going to wander around and find a blue stone, Mm -hmm. I'm going to wander around all day looking for that until I get another crazy idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, to to connect with your higher self, you have to be prepared to embrace a little craziness. You've got to get (laughs) really loose. Have you ever seen a bunch of little kids playing, four or Mm five-year-olds, and they're doing crazy things and putting on silly hats and dancing? You've got to get a bit like that to really connect with your higher self because – You know how it is like men and women are totally different in the way we think, Mm -hmm. okay? But we have common ground as a child, the little boy inside of every man and the little girl inside of every woman. You know, those two can hold hands and play and dance and have more fun together. But intellectually, we're quite different. We're going in different directions. But it's kind of like that. You have to, the inner child, uh, you have to let loose the inner child to really connect with your higher self. What do you think that is, that, that, that innocence that we lose in the process of getting older? Is it the pollution of the earth, or um, do we just kind of veer off into these polarities where we buy towards more masculine energy, or perhaps there's an uh, energetic dimensional well, aspect of things? All, all of that happens, but in a nutshell, what we do... <clears throat> we we become more and more focused on the physical world as we grow and because we have to focus ourselves here in order to make sense out of it, in order to progress, to learn and do things here. So we get habituated to focusing on only on the physical. And in childhood, you may have seen fairies and things like I did. Well, fairies, they exist. And, uh, but as you grow up, then you learn to put those things behind you and focus on your work, do your homework and mathematics and stuff like that. And we get habituated to focusing on on the real world around us. Now, that world which we've created, including a lot of uh, false beliefs that we take on along the way, takes us out of the, away from the frequency, out of the flow, which is like a spontaneous, foolish flow that children have. It takes us away from that. And it's a real effort for people to be able to get back into that loose, open-minded, opening yourself to ideas and inspiration and things like that, that and be able state. to dance it. Kind of that, um, that flow state when we were younger. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the nearest I can explain it, but it is, like, necessary to be to be able to be foolish. Do you think that a lot of the – I'm sorry. Um, if you're too serious, you will never be able to connect. Ever. Yeah. You've got to be like foolish. Everyone. You've got to tell jokes and dance and do silly things and talk to animals and stuff. And Okay. That, so, inner, that inner self is, is tied into – I'm sorry. <laughs> you think that, that inner self is, is tied into that childlike state? That's where we're most uh, in resonance with it or – Well, a good example here is, as you were saying, you've done the Iowatha thing. How do you pronounce that? Ayahuasca. In, in the Amazon. Ayahuasca, yeah. Now, if you were at a, uh, a place that knows what they're doing, they would have done inner child work on you. They actually, mentioned, they actually mentioned that specifically. There was um, They talked about someone who was there for a traumatic experience, and they were talking about um, soul retrieval for one of the individuals that was there, that they went looking for this person's soul because they had some kind mm-hmm. of you know psychiatric issue. And I remember them talking that one of the shamans was actually saying that specifically that's interesting what was the name of this place by the way uh it was in the, it was in Iquitos. it was called nihu rao and it was um one of the the owners of it is also a physician and i was um lucky enough to get in contact with him and he was of i know that the shaman that he worked with there that was running the place there were two shamans but the elder shaman was from um I think his name was um, Guillermo, who's one of the larger the, the larger shamans in that area, one of the older shamans, and he ran, I believe it was something Anaconda, which was the, the larger 
um, camp, I guess, for these for these experiences. And there were some issues. I don't want to get into the details, or I don't know the specifics, but I heard you know certain things went on in certain states with I guess uh, women, and that kind of uh, because they were in that state and they were possibly taken advantage of, or who knows what would happen. And he started his own kind of um, uh, ayahuasca experience with this specific okay. position. Yeah, you really need some knowledge of psychology to uh, get into that. If you are at working as a leader, um, it's hugely helpful. But if you look at the importance of the inner child, which is a bit, it's just too simple for most people to get. I mean, a lot of the uh, holy book talk about this as well. Like the Bible, you've got to be able to see through the eyes of a child or something like that. It's something about being being like a child, childlike state, mm -hmm. because it really is in that state. And I don't mean the foolish side of you, but what of the, is a child? A child is, doesn't know anything. They're completely blank slate. They just know what's happening in front of them. They don't have any preconceived notions or beliefs in that. They just look at something for what it really is. Mm -hmm. And they don't try and complicate it or explain it too badly because a mind and a rational reasoning and that gets in the way of this because it's this is this is relating to the muse the muse um, whereby great ideas for music or poetry or whatever just pops into your head this and when you are in the muse you get this creative maelstrom comes through you pouring through you and then it goes away and it's like and then there's nothing coming through it again you know, so all creative people, including myself, we caught the muse. And I've learned over the years that the muse is more to the muse than meets the eye. When the muse comes, it is uh, actually, you could say, it's a presence of God, you could say, hmm. an angel, whatever, a, a, a spirit of creativity. But it's more than that. Good example. A few months ago, I'm sitting in an old English pub here with my son, Ben who's a, a psychotherapist here. And uh, we do the same work of been sharing this sort of thing for, for decades. <clears throat> and uh, we're sitting there and we start having a heart to heart over a couple of pints of good English beer. And subject of honesty comes up. And Ben was telling me how integral that is to him himself, the honesty. And I start talking about that and then we felt the muse appear, we call this grace, when grace appears, you get this tingle up and down your spine and you know something's there, and then the barmaid came over and I'd given her $20 and she gave me change from 100 and it's like, dee -dee 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 -dee, straight okay. away, about honesty, <laughs> gave us $20, he gave us change from 100 right. and, we look, and I looked at Ben, he looked at, we were both know exactly what just happened, wow. he said, oh my god. And we told the barmaid and that, you know, because we knew this was a test. It's like you're talking about honesty. Let's see how honest you are. Wow. You know? And yeah. they gave it to us. We had to get the manager over and ring, he rung up the till because the barmaid refused. No, I couldn't possibly have done that. And yet he found the till was down that amount. So he took the money back off us. And unfortunately, the barmaid got in a bit of trouble over that. Didn't lose his <laughs> job. But it's, uh, to but little things like that, synchronicity to that happen when you could say the uh, grace or the muse is around with you and things, everything works, it flows. Okay, so that means you're kind of on the path, you would say, when those kind of flow states or the synchronicities seem to keep opening up. Definitely. Now, of course, the point of spiritual development, in a sense that we're talking about here, is to try and stay in this state of grace longer, to stay in the flow longer, because typically you go in it and out of it, in it and out of it. It the just goes away for no reason. It's like we get energetically drained by it, and it just goes away. Huh. And the, but the idea, of course, is to get into that state more and more and stay in it longer and longer, and maybe sometimes to actually stay in there. The best I've done in that sense is to spend the entire day in a state of grace where everything literally life around me worked. I mean, at the time, um, a good example, several years ago, um, I uh, used to smoke a pipe. I gave it up seven years ago, probably orange tobacco. 
Um, when I got off in a completely strange town in London, I was doing a workshop tour there, and I, I walked out of the airport and I pulled out a nice cigar, sort of a nice fat cigar. I've been dying to smoke because it's a dry trip. And I put it there, and my cigarette lighter was empty. And I'm going, damn. Mm. And within two <laughs> seconds, a lit match appeared in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No way. And uh, wow. everything I wanted just appeared in front of me. <laughs> wow. And, yeah. And some of them are good things and some of them are scary things. But the scary things actually had really good outcomes. They taught me things. Hmm. It's For example... When you're in a state of flow, I do what I call bee following, when you follow signs and omens. Mm. You see a sign, you see an omen, and this is what guides you. This mm -hmm. is what keeps you alive. If you're out in the bush or the wilderness somewhere, this will lead you to water. This mm -hmm. will lead you to food. This will, whatever you need, it will lead you to because it's locked in your intention. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the middle of this town in the south of England somewhere, and standing there with my suitcases and that on wheels and that for me, and I was about to get on the train to go to London, and this bee went by. I know about bees. Bees are a little bit mystical. Mm. And I, I sort of, a little shudder went through me. I sat very still. The bee went by. So it was a close call. And then the bee came back. Mm. And he hovered in front of me like this, and I wasn't wearing glasses. Hovered right in front of me, almost touching the middle of my forehead like that, and looking at me. And I had to look at it, looked at the bee, his little face looking at me. I said, we're going to go somewhere, aren't we? And the bee went, oh, man. <laughs> okay, let's go. And then the bee went, Zzz, and he went off. So I followed the bee. And I walked down, you know, a couple of hundred yards down there, and the bee kept stopping and waiting for me to catch up. And I buzz, buzz. And then the bee went across the road. And uh, I walked across the road there following the bee. This is what God has given me to do, so I'm going to do it. And I crossed, crossed the road and walked down a couple more doors and the bee landed on the door. And obviously, he just stopped there. He wanted me to go in this door. And I looked up and I saw real ales, organic beer. It's an old English pub serving organic beers. And I'm thinking, how hard can this be? I'm with you there. I'm, I'm walking the walk. So I go inside and order a pint of organic beer. And I'm thinking, this is good. This is a good one. You know, follow the bee here, organic beer. This is priceless. And yeah, but the end, the end of that journey. I to cut a long story short here. I ended up somewhere down south in the Cornwall, somewhere. At, no, in Plymouth, at, uh, quite a big town there. I was being stalked by a couple of mugs, about to have my throat cut, and I was terrified. Now. I'm 75% paralyzed in my arms at the time because of a neck injury. I'm like helpless and I've got these muggers closing in. And then all of a sudden, this rough looking guy pulled up in the cab in front of me and started walking by, leather jacket, bald head, you know, like this, you know, walked by. And I tried to call out with a cabbie, but he took off. And I'm in the middle of this car park at midnight, uh, about to be mugged and probably killed. And this guy walked by me, and that was when I learned. And I had tears running down my face. I was so frightened. I said, oh, please, God, please help me. And the guy behind me stopped and heard the gravel and ran back towards me. I said, oh, no, here it comes, you know. And the guy grabbed me by the shoulder and said, you're all right, mate. You don't look all right. You look lost. You don't want to get lost around here, mate. He said, people get killed here every week. You better come with me. Wow. And he took me to safety. And I know what had happened there because I saw it clairvoyantly. This man was possessed by an angel. Hmm. And but only the exact instant that I asked for help, it was given. Hmm. It waited until then. Now, through all this, and it was quite a saga, quite a saga. And uh, I learned a great deal about the nature of reality and life and how it works by this experience just by following this little beat. Which you'd have to be crazy to do. Probably a bee, I mean. Okay, so Mr. Bruce, we've we've had you for uh, almost two and a half, yeah, two and a half hours now, and and well, I have to say, you goes quick. You are you are qu quite an amazing person. I, I've followed your work for you know years now, 
and it it's quite an honor it was quite an honor to have you here and and i know i know your time is valuable so i mean thank you so much for for being here how can um how can what are you working on now how how can we find your work and, and you know like what are, what are you up to right now and it's how can li- how can our listeners find you and, and well i've taken a hiatus from writing serious books for a few years and i've been focusing on um my website web presence and creating video based programs okay so we're learning about filming and all that um and we've got a bunch of uh, video based programs uh we have one called Manifestation and Self-Healing, one called After Projection Mastery, and another one called Raising Kundalini, mm-hmm. and, uh, which is the newest one. And mm-hmm. uh, if you go to astrodynamics.com, you can take a look at them. Cool. I also have a community website, which is free, with a lot of material on it, and a huge forums at astrodynamics.org. So go to either one of those places. You can find out a lot more about me and I've got a lot of free stuff on the .org site uh, for tutorials and articles and things like that my other site is a more commercial site so you've got to pay for stuff there so I was checking there's those a forms. fair bit of free stuff there so I, was, I was checking those forms and you actually uh, respond pretty pretty you know pretty often on there to people's inquiries so now I've got a section there called ask Robert Bruce and there's broken up into general questions, questions about Kundalini, which is connected to the program, and uh, a few things like that. I've learned it's wise because the forums are quite active. I just stick to my little area, which is, you know, ask me direct yeah. questions, and and hopefully people keep it short, you know, just a sentence or two <laughs> asking the Twitter link. Question. <laughs> Twitter link. <laughs> Because I'll tell you what, if you, you know, you write me a four-page letter uh, without using any punctuation whatsoever, <laughs> pet peeve, <laughs> um, it's a bit, it takes a bit longer to answer those. Are you, are you active on social media? Is there a place where people, if they have any inquiries, perhaps on Twitter or Facebook, they I can do, contact you? Or I do have a Facebook page. You'd have to search for it. I've got a Twitter somewhere too as well. I occasionally get on, but my main, my main contact is mainly through the uh, question and answer section mm-hmm. on my page. Mm-hmm. You can also email the help desk at my uh, astrodynamics.com and the help desk can forward letters to me okay. and stuff. So we can put those links up when we uh, when we upload the podcast to the website sure. also. So just let us know, yeah. So got- so I'll just do the outro here and we and then we'll do a post and just thoughts. So um Mr. Bruce, it's been an honor to to have you on. Thank you so much. This is the Human Experience Podcast. I'm Xavier, my co-host, Dr. G, his first show tonight. So quite <laughs> glad to have him on with us. Hey. Mr. Mr. Bruce, you, you're an honor. You're you're quite a, a, per, a personality. You're you have so many stories. Uh, we it's would awesome. love to. We would love. Yeah, this was amazing. We would love to have you on again in the future. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for lending us your time and your stories. Really, really, really amazing stuff. You're most welcome. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks again. Sure. And catch us, catch us next time here on the Human XP. And I'm Xavier. We're signing off.